Hey guys. This is part 13 of what if Naruto died and became a hollow. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 52 Los Dos Reyes Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaizu As Mayuri's giant bankai grew within his own specimen lab, the walls began to crumble in on themselves. Specimens that were in jars were crushed by the massive weight of the bankai as it continued to grow. Rubble fell down on shelves and shelves of valuable specimens, crushing them and eliminating precious data from Mayuri's grasp. In a way, Mayuri's life work was being destroyed by him. Even the foundation of the building was crumbling, which all but ensured that everything here would be destroyed in the aftermath of the events. Shinigami around the Suriidei, while still immersed in their own battles, paused to look as Mayuri's gigantic bankai rose above the buildings, but they also noticed the specimen lab had been completely destroyed. All the research the captain had ever undertaken was now essentially worthless. By extension, the source of much of their technology had been destroyed. Even if they ended the attack right here and now, it would take a long time to recover from such a blow to their important supplies. How would they hunt hollows without the 12th Division's technology? Keikuratsuchi Taisha, a member of the 12th Division who was out on the front line stuttered, recognizing his captain's bank eye immediately. Another member of the same division ran up to him. That's Kuratsuchi Taisha's bank eye. This situation can't be that serious, can it? To have the captain's resort to using Bankai, he commented. It was the first time either of them had seen Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaizu in an actual combat scenario. While the two Shinigami stared in awe of the Bankai, within the lab itself, Sale was unimpressed. He already knew all about Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaizu from the reports on the captains, though he had to admit he was a little excited that he got to see a Bankai up close. A giant golden mixture between a human baby and a caterpillar that wore a red robe and a golden halo. It matched the pictures within the report, and Sale also knew about its special power. H. How dare you? Mayuri said, a little late on the uptake. Sale slithered over to where the captain was standing, having activated his bank eye out of desperation. In the ensuing chaos, he had managed to get all of the possessed specimens off of him, but he had suffered several gashes and bite marks in the process. H. How dare you treat my specimen lab in such a manner? I've lost all interest in collecting you. That's it. Don't think that you're going to leave here alive, you lowly errand car. Mayuri shouted. Sale touched one of the whirling tendrils on his back. The gas that Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaizu expelled was filled with bacteria. He knew how to counter it already with a specially made antidote that he had prepared for the battle. All he had left to do was attack as well as make it seem that he had no clue about that bank eye's abilities. Oh, please. It's not like it truly matters. A subpar scientist and captain like you could never truly match up to a perfect being such as myself. And yet, I don't believe I have truly shown you what I am capable of. Kuratsuchi Mayuri Mayuri grit his teeth in anger, though the captain himself wasn't what Seo was concerned about. Rather, the gigantic bank eye caterpillar baby thing that was fidgeting in front of him was Sale's real concern. He didn't think bank eyes were quite that, odd, for lack of a better word. Granted, coming from him that sounded rather wrong, but it still piqued his interest. For starters, he knew that most bank eyes weren't living creatures, but this one was. That meant that he could work his magic on it, so to speak. He was at a heavy advantage. And you call yourself a scientist? How dare you? Mayuri shouted. Even if we are on opposite sides, I never would have imagined that a fellow scientist would be so apathetic to valuable research. Even if your ridiculous attack succeeded, there would have been much to gain in this research lab. And now, there's nothing, Mayuri said fatally. Sale looked bored. Like I said, it doesn't even matter. Your specimens aren't worth anything to me. Nothing in soul society is worth anything to me. Neither combatant said anything anymore. Sale was too bored, and Mayuri was far too incensed to even think about more conversation with the disgusting Erencar in front of him. The giant bank eye, baby opened its mouth. 
There was Sale's cue. The tendrils on his back flared out, and they covered Sale's entire body, wrapping around him in a defensive sphere. That won't help you now, Mayuri exclaimed, as Kanjiki Ashisoji Jizu expelled its deadly, purple toxin. Sale closed his eyes, allowing the abilities of his second release to work their charm. His worm-like tail retracted into his body, and all that remained was a dial of red tendrils in the middle of the room. The tendrils swelled in size as the gas washed over Sale, but that was all according to his plan. In reality, inside the sphere, the ends of the tendrils ejected little needles that injected a type of specialized antidote inside Sale's systems, effectively neutralizing all of the poison. Inside the sphere of fleshy tendrils, Sale was thinking of his next move. This would effectively end it, since it was all he had prepared. If this failed, he would have to wing it from that point on. No problem really, since his abilities were likely beyond Kuratsuchi Mayuri's anyway, but it never hurt to be on the safe side. There's only one thing to do now. His golden eyes peered out through an opening in the defense. Mayuri was studying him closely. His second release enhanced his first release's powers to an unheard of level, and with a bank eye that was a living creature, he could do more than just possess it only when eaten. Though it was something that big, he would have to invade it and fuse with its central nervous system. He had his eye on Mayuri himself too, making sure that he didn't move. It was clear that his bankai was something that he ordered from afar, meaning he didn't have a Zanpakutu to engage in direct combat like his shirkai. If he tried to engage Sail unarmed, he would be destroyed. The fleshy tendrils retracted, coming to rest back upon his wings, but Sail was nowhere near finished. The segments of his worm-like abdomen lengthened, allowing him to slither across the ground and in general gave him access to a more streamlined form. The giant bankai in front of him was a sitting duck, as it was just standing there, waiting for its master's next orders. Mayuri had seen that his poison had been neutralized, so he moved on to the next step. Attack! Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaizu The bankai roared and retracted the many blades on its underbelly slithering towards where Sale was moving. Too late! Sale shouted back. The Novena Espada flipped into midair, curling up into a ball. Large spines, similar to Kanjiki Ashisoji Jizes, emerged from every part of his body, and he whirled through the air towards his adversary. He was much, much faster than Mayuri's Bankai, and as such he was able to penetrate into the Bankai's side without much trouble. Kanjiki Ashisoji Jizes roared in pain, as one of the spines penetrate the skin on its side. Despite his anger, Mayuri watched, fascinated by this turn of events. One of Sale's spines ripped a hole in the Bankai's flesh, and Sale's more streamlined form allowed him to slither in underneath the Bankai's tissue, effectively entering its body. Once Sale was fully inside, a sticky green fluid leaked from the wound, cauterizing and gluing the injury back shut once again as Sale entered Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaiza's bloodstream. What? A perplexed Mayuri state. Mayuri, for everything he did right, found himself at a loss. Without all his inventions and preparations, he didn't know how to proceed or how to halt this menace in his tracks. For all his genius, Kuratsuchi Mayuri was not good with hands-on situations, and was not good at thinking on his feet. He only had one more trick up his sleeve, but if the situation didn't call for it, Mayuri still couldn't keep the look of curiosity off his face as a strange symbol appeared across Kanjiki Ashisoji Jaiza's eyes. When that occurred, the Bankai stopped in place, its blades retracted back into its body, and it stopped breathing poison. The main power in my Segunda Etapa is essentially upgrading abilities that I already had before. One of those such abilities was my ability to possess living things. Whereas before I could only possess a life form in the event that I was eaten, now I have the ability to invade a life form's body infused with its central nervous system, effectively allowing me to control the body for myself. Sale said. His voice reverberated all throughout the area, and no one could really tell where it was coming from. Mayuri almost grinned. That meant that the battle was going exactly in his favor. He could still use his ace in the hole. Sale turned his own bankai against him using its blades to try and impale the captain right where he stood. Mayuri didn't even do anything, but rather he just stood there and watched as his own bankai exploded. Mayuri grinned as his shirkai returned to him, 
Maybe that was enough to do in the errand car. However, when he saw a shadow inside the plume of smoke, his grin faltered. Before he could even react, a large tendril shot out of the smoke and wrapped around Mayuri, constricting him in place. Burk. He lurched through the air, as the clearly still alive sail floated back towards the ground, still holding Mayuri in one of his tendrils. The captain's arm holding his Zanpakutu was held stiff at his side. He was out of tricks. Sail began to cackle. Well, Kuratsuchi Mayuri, did you think that just because you disabled your Bankai that I'm defenseless? Or did you think that I too would die in that blast? You make me laugh. He paused for a moment, bringing his tendril back to look Mayuri in the eye. Vaguely, he noticed that one of his ears were gone. You went on and on about me being a true scientist. But if I had to pick straight up, I would rather be a non-scientist who knows how to at least survive than a scientist who is absolutely defenseless without his trinkets. Why you are no scientist? Mayuri managed to grunt out to the bored-looking sail. With a great deal of effort, he managed to lift his Zanpaku to arm. Sail looked apathetic. I wouldn't try anything if I were you. I could crush your spine right now in your condition and whatever you try is pointless anyway. Sayo commented. A chain and a blade fell from Mayuri's sleeve, and using his riatsu, it locked around his shirk eye. It was one of those sides that was normally stored in one of his ears. With all his effort, his tossed his shirk eye out. It was a pathetic effort, but miraculously it got the job done. Mayuri's shirk eye flew to the side, before Mayuri gripped the chain and guided it all the way back around. Sale looked at the flying blade with surprise, turning frantically to get a glimpse at it, but with his grip so firm on Mayuri, he didn't have enough time to react any further. The blade closed in on him. And when it reached its mark, it had impaled Sale from directly behind him. The paralysis Shirkai had stabbed him right through the chest, and he cried out in agony when it occurred. He could already sense the mobility leaving from his limbs, and before the paralysis could take full effect, he raised his right arm and yanked the blade out none too gently. He threw it at Mayuri as a fountain of blood gushed from his torso, coating his tendrils and tail. The shirkai also stabbed Mayuri, though it wasn't nearly as deep as Sail's wound. However, the blade had punctured the soul's sleep, the source of all spiritual power. Screw you! Before mobility left Sail's limbs completely, he exerted his full strength on Mayuri, squeezing the captain tighter and tighter. He grinned sadistically as Mayuri was crushed, and he could already feel the pressure building up. Snap! There came a loud snapping noise as Sail exerted all the force he could muster, and Mayuri's spinal cord snapped from the extreme pressure Sail had been applying. With the last of his mobility, the tendril holding Mayuri threw him like a ragdoll away from the scene. He flopped onto the ground twenty feet away, completely useless. His own shirkai fell from his body adding even more paralysis to him. He was now completely immobile. He had already realized just what had happened to him with a broken spine and a lack of Ryoku. D damn you. Why you v crippled me after l life? And normally, H healing an eye injury like T this would be N no. It W would be N nothing. But you've severed my S soul S sleep. Without Ariatsu, I see can hope to H heal from an eye injury like this. I'm P permanently P paralyzed, the pitiful Mayuri croaked. Sale, meanwhile, was clutching his wound. He too was immobile, but he was bleeding far too much. Fuck you! If it wasn't for your damn paralysis, healing this wound would be easy. To prove a point, Sale tried to move one of his tendrils, but it wouldn't budge in the slightest. He wasn't able to get to his healing serum, which could likely heal his paralysis instantly. His tendril continued to hang there limply, as more and more blood gushed out from Sale's wound. At this rate. I can't die here. No way. I was the head scientist in the Reino Animal and in Las Noches. I was going to expand even further, into the Soul Society. I'm the perfect scientist and the perfect being. There's no way I can lose here, he said. Despite his injuries, Mayuri scoffed. Naruto has acknowledged me as the perfect being. That's why he gave me the rank of Novena Espada, and the rank of Head Scientist. He'll save me. The Erenkar army cannot survive without me. You'll see. 
Sayo was starting to get hysterical. You're pitiful, Mayuri said, as he struggled to turn his head away from the dying Aaron Carr. He was aloof on the outside, but in all seriousness, he wished he was in the position of the Aaron Carr before him. Death seemed like a suitable alternative to being crippled for the rest of his life. Damn it! Damn it! The impaling wound was too serious, and Sale was losing too much blood. He was beginning to feel dizzy, and he could no longer remain standing as he collapsed onto the ground and bled out further. Waste of time. Mayuri said though in reality it was a Pyrrhic victory for him as well. To the Godii 13, he was as good as dead, and he would remain a shell of his former self for here on afterward. W what and now? Sale got out, before his eyes clouded over. At this point, the Novina Espada became the first of the ten strongest Aaron cars and die in the Soul Society invasion. Naruto's eyes snapped open as a familiar Ryatsu disappeared. Sail is dead, he told himself simply, as he felt the Novina Espada's Ryatsu disappear completely. The other Espada would be sure to notice it as well. Did he at least take out his opponent? Naruto asked himself. He had felt the two Ryatsu signatures go out but at this point he could feel either one of them. That left nine Espada left to fulfill the duty he had created. Sale was one of the weaker Espada, but he had hoped that he could at least avoid any Espada casualties before the main event with the Zero Division. That, and there's one other Espada that I may have to neutralize. Naruto thought to himself, feeling Barrigan's spiritual pressure. He was beginning to engage in battle. What? The Twelfth Division is in shambles. Aburai Rinji cried out, voicing the concerns of all the other vice-captains as well. In the ten years since the Aizen incident, his abilities had drastically changed, though his appearance had changed strikingly little per Shinigami standards, with the exception of the spread of tattoos along his body. Yes, that's why Kuratsuchi Fukutechu isn't here, Hinamori stated. With Kakashi's death ten years ago, she had been promoted to the vice-captain's spot for the 5th Division and Sasakai Fukutechu is absent because he is assigned to protect the captain commander. Kusajishi Fukutechu never comes to these meetings anyway. Shit, how is this a mandatory meeting of the vice-captains if there are only seven of the thirteen attending? Rinji cried. It can't be helped. Rin Fukutechu, Tsunade Fukutechu, and Hiba Fukutechu are all currently in Hueco Mundo. We are just going to have to cover for them and give out orders to their divisions while they are absent. Ranjika piped up, while she lounged on the other side of the room. These Arankar are strong, and they literally came out of nowhere with this attack. We will have to make up for this somehow. Hesajai commented, to which no one responded. Should we? Before Rinji could finish that sentence, a blanket of Ryatsu washed over the seven vice-captains in the room. With some of them, their hands flew to their Zanpakidus instinctively, as beads of sweat formed on all of their faces. What's with this Ryatsu? Is it an errand car? Where is it coming from? Renji said out loud, voicing everyone's concerns again. Then, there was a flash of movement, and a millisecond later, a tall, dark-skinned errand car was standing in the doorway, blocking the exit. An errand car! Hinamori shouted as she hopped to her feet. What do you want? Who are you? Renji demanded, as he drew his Zanpakutu. The black errand car closed his eyes. I am Zamari Ruros, the Octava Espada. I am searching for division captains, but looking at you, it appears that I have stumbled across some sort of meeting of the vice captains. So I suppose I shall have to settle for you, he said. Hinamori backed away out of fear, though the others held their ground. Most of them had their Zanpakidus drawn by now. An Espada? Does that mean that Aizen is behind this attack? I thought he was dead, Renji asked. No, you are correct in assuming that Aizen is dead. Our attack is led by the glorious Naruto-sama, and it is his wish that I destroy every Shinigami I come across. Zamari replied. I knew it. They're trying to kill us all. What do we do, Aburai Fukutechu? Hisajai piped up. Rinji looked at the Arankar, who never let his expression change even in the face of such numbers. Seven on one, hmm? It's not enough. It's not nearly enough, if you hold the vice-captain rank, he commented, much to the anger of Renji. 
You think you can take us all on? Yes. I am an espada, and you Shinigami are mere vice-captains. There is not an espada in our ranks that would lose to such refuse that I am slightly insulted that I am the one stuck killing the lot of you. Aburai Fukutechu. This Erenkar is a major threat to Seoul society. We need to fulfill our duties as vice-captains and eliminate him. Nanao piped up, speaking for the first time. You don't need to tell me twice. Renji shouted. Howl Zabamaru. Renji's Zanpakuta turned into his characteristic extending shirkai, which he then swung at Zamari. Zamari blinked, before he disappeared immediately from the view of all the vice-captains, before reappearing in Renji's blind spot. Wah! I didn't even see him move, Renji said in confusion, before something else made him balk even more. All around the room, every other vice-captain had their swords out at the ready, and was clashing blades with another identical Zamari. Altogether, there were seven Zamaris around the room, including the one that had dodged Renji's attack. Gamelo Sonido I have massively improved over my previous number of five total clones. There will be more than enough to deal with Shinigami at the vice-captain level. Don't underestimate us. Reap, Kazushini. Hisagei shouted, as his dangerous-looking Shurkai also entered the battlefield. He threw the bladed scythe out catching the clone and dispelling it into the sound that formed it. Another one attacked him, but that one too was sliced in half from the reach of Kazushini. When Hisagei retracted the blade back, Hisagei rested it over his shoulder. Do you think your clones will be enough to beat us? Everyone here is a high-ranked member of the Godii 13 and is trained to keep up with hollow tricks like yours. Snap, Tobium. Growl, Heiniko. Smash, Gejitsuburi. The other vice-captains activated their shirkai as well, rapidly dispatching the clones in front of them. Zamari narrowed his eyes at the display in front of him, before he sighed. Such arrogance. Do you truly believe that simple clones are all that I am capable of? I have not even entered my resurrection yet. Should I decide to use it, this battle would be over instantly. What? Renji exclaimed. Fortunately for you, it has not quite gotten to that stage yet. Zamari said. All of his clones were gone, so in response to that he drew his Zanpakuta for the first time. He reappeared behind his Sagei, catching him off guard completely. My Sonido is among the fastest in the Espada, save for Naruto-sama. It would be unwise to try and even follow me with your eyes. He taunted, as he slashed into his Sagei's back. The vice-captain of the Ninth Division stumbled forward as a fair amount of blood gushed from the wound on his back. Hisagei, shouted Rinji, ignoring the title. Where are you looking at? Zamari said, reappearing behind Rinji. He just got up Shukai around in time to block the attack, and even countered when he extended his weapon. Zamari, however, was ready for him, and disappeared yet again when it was clear that the weapon was headed his way. Hinamori was helping Hisagei to his feet while Ranjiku, Iba, Nanao, and Omida were all standing their ground with Samari, who had reappeared in the middle of the room. Tobiem! Hinamori shouted, flicking her Zanpakutu and sending a massive fireball towards Samari. The Octava Espada disappeared as the fireball nearly hit Renji and blasted a hole in the back wall. Samari reappeared on the outside of it. Hinamori! Watch where you're attacking with that thing! Renji yelled after nearly getting singed by it. Hinamori blushed. Sorry, Aburai kun You can apologize later. He's on the roof now. Adie exclaimed, his body leaning out of the hole that Hinamori had created. Hisagei was breathing heavily, kneeling on the ground. Hisagei, are you all right? Renji said, rushing to his aid. Hisagei nodded. I'll be f fine. Let's just go after him before he targets anyone else. The Shinigami almost rushed out of the hole made by Tobium, though they stopped before that when they were almost obliterated by a point-blank Siro from Zamari in a sneak attack from the roof. If it wasn't for Hinamori's quick thinking, they would have all been engulfed in the blast. Zamari was on the roof of the building, feeling no discomfort with the odd foot holding. The seven Shinigami flashed onto the roof, ready to begin the second round. Zamari was also ready. Get enraged, Ira. 
A towering beast emerged onto the battlefield, visible from nearly every corner of the Suriidei. Shinigami gaped at the giant hollow with the ten tattoo on his chest, who was clearly ready to cause some destruction. He resembled an ankylosaur in his shape, with his brown body, mask, and the club-like tail coming from his abdomen. He had several pairs of legs and was wearing a thin layer of cloth that was covering the first parts of his legs. Yami Largo was ready for battle. Bugs? Bugs? You're all bugs waiting to be crushed. Die! Yami shouted, chewing the scenery as the Shinigami ran away from the monstrous hollow. Several dozen of them were crushed to death in one punch from Yami, as the punch obliterated a major alleyway that ran through the Siriidei. He spotted more of them running away. Trash! He roared, as he reared back his arm for another punch towards the other alleyway that the group of Shinigami was running down. Before he could connect, a metallic arm covered in an armored vambrace put itself between him and his targets. Huh! Yami reacted in one of the common emotions for him, confusion. The decima scratched his head with a massive forefinger, looking at the metal arm which connected to a body that was as big as he was. A massive metal. What blocked my attack? What is this thing? The giant metal samurai that blocked Yami's attack returned to its normal stance. Yami still looked confused. Look! It's Kamamura Taisha's Bankai! A Shinigami shouted from the road down below. Huh! Taicho? Yami said to himself. His brain registered the words in his head, and he remembered that he was supposed to be doing something for Naruto. He looked towards the streets, where every single Shinigami was running from the two giants in the Suriidei. That is, all but one. A large canine wearing a white haori was standing his ground in front of Yami, a stern look on his face. Yami's confusion faded immediately, and a massive grin split upon his face. Oh, a captain. You are a brute, but you have already shown a great display of strength. Bayakuya commented, as the Sixth Division's barracks were practically destroyed by Neutra's rampage. He was standing in the rubble, while Bayakuya was out in the street in a secluded area where not many Shinigami were rushing to and fro. They could go all out here. Noitra twirled his odd Zanpakutu around, stepping out of the rubble and into the street. A crazed grin was on his face, as he noticed that his opponent was completely unharmed. Bayakuya decided to test his opponent. Had a number four, Bayakurai, he said calmly, firing a cork burst of white lightning from his fingertip. Noitra didn't even flinch, and instead merely held out his weapon and deflected the kiddo off to the side. Bayakuya flashed behind him, getting underneath his guard immediately. He drew his Zanpakutu, and noting the apparently slowness of the errand car, stabbed him straight through the stomach. A-U-G-H-H-H, not? Noitra faked, as the tip of the blade jammed against his body, nowhere near enough to penetrate his super-strong hero. Bayakuya looked slightly perturbed and he backed away when he saw that his attack was a failure. Bitch! My hero is the strongest amongst the Espada, and it has only gotten stronger through my training. There's no way your flimsy fucking blade can penetrate it. So it seems. My sealed blade is clearly not enough to defeat you, and Hadakita does not seem to have an effect. Bayakuya admitted. He raised his blade, holding it vertically just past his face. Scatter! Senbin Zakura. Bayakuya's Zanpakutu dissolved into hundreds of small pink blades that resembled cherry blossoms when scattering on the wind. Noitra didn't look impressed. Is that it? A bunch of the petals brushed up against Noitra, and he stared blankly at them as they did absolutely nothing. None of them were capable of penetrating his strong hero. What is with your gay ass Zanpakutu? Flower petals? Are you serious? Noitra mocked. He didn't seem to realize that the flower petals could normally rip a person to shreds. How disappointing. I was hoping for something a little more effective. Noitra shouted, as he rushed by Akuya. The 6th Division's captain swung the hilt of his Zanpakutu, conjuring up a stream of petals that served as a shield from Noitra's downward slash. Noitra retaliated and slashed at Bayakuya from the right, who avoided the attack by flashing behind Noitra again. He raised his Zanpakutu in the air, and Noitra looked up as he saw the thousands of blades hovering in the air around fifteen feet, poised to come down upon him. 
that converged into a few dozen larger blades, also poised to come down upon Neutra. He swung his zampaka to hilt down with a degree of finesse, allowing the blades to strike Neutra. The sexta just stood there and took it, and as expected, it did not pierce his hiero, even if they did stick out of his body. The attack forced him against the wall, however, which almost crumbled into pieces. Even if you do it over and over again, the result will be the same. Neutra cackled before he tried to raise an arm to pluck one of the blades out of his body. He found that he couldn't raise his arm. W. What is this? Bakudo number 30, Shitatsu Sansen. You did not even notice that I hid a bakudo within my shirk eye. You seem to have tough skin, and my shirk eye's ability clearly will not finish you off. I just had to use a way to keep you in place. Bayakuya commented, pointing to the fact that three of the blades were of a bright yellow instead of pink. Damn it! Neutra cursed, waving his arms around. The yellow light had pinned him completely against the wall. And now that you are, I will not hold back. Bayakuya said cryptically, as his Zanpakutu materialized back into a solid form. He raised his Zanpakutu, pointing it towards the ground. He let go of the sword. Bankai. The sword rippled into the ground like it was a pool of water, disappearing into the liquid earth. Neutra looked confused at the display, wondering how he was going to attack. Senbenzakura Kagyoshi. As Bayakuya said those words, a gigantic sword poked out of the ground, followed by another, and another. All in all, at least twelve giant swords rose out of the ground like columns, flanking Bayakuya on either side. Neutra looked surprised. The swords glowed pink for a moment, before they dispersed into even more tiny shards that floated on the wind, this time their numbers somewhere in the millions. Neutra's emotions went from surprise to amusement directly after that. More numbers? Is that all your bank I can do? More numbers isn't gonna change shit, you know. Neutra screamed, as he exerted all of his strength and broke out of the binding kid fairly easily. He grabbed his Zanpakutu off of the ground and tossed it by its chain, sending the extendable weapon flying. Bayakuya fired another Bayakurai at the weapon, deflecting it much like Neutra did before. It flew back towards Neutra's hand. Bayakuya looked contemplative. He could use more of his destructive techniques, but that would leave the Sixth Division in ruins. They were in a time of war, however, and the use of their full power was permitted. A little property damage would be overlooked in the face of this crisis. Your defenses mean absolutely nothing, Bayakuya said. Neutra grinned. He was getting a little bit flustered, though he still didn't show it on the outside. He had read the file on Kachiki Bayakuya which meant that he knew one way to get him to drop his guard. You have a little sister, don't you? Bayakuya halted in place. Since you're so damn weak, I think I'm gonna go after that little bitch when I'm done with you. He taunted. There it is. Bayakuya's face screwed up, and for the smallest split second, he dropped both his guard and his concentration, which was all the time Neutra needed to exploit it. Normally, Noidra would be unable to outspeed Baikuya, but with the captain flustered, he was easily able to get into close quarters and slash at Baikuya. The captain regained his concentration enough to block the attack before it made more than a shallow wound, but he was still injured from it. Noitra grabbed the hem of his Hayori when Baikuya reacted to the strike, using his superior strength to hold him in place. Baikuya narrowed his eyes at Noitra, but then he noticed exactly how close Noitra was to him. You want to use that bank eye of yours on me, and hurt yourself in the process? Neutra pointed out. He was within 85 centimeters of Bayakuya. Close combat doesn't suit you with your Zanpakutu. There's an area where you won't allow your blades to come within, cause you'll hurt yourself if you do. Scum. Bayakuya hissed. Neutra ignored the jab, before he used his free arm to lower his Zanpakutu right at Bayakuya's neck. The captain didn't flinch when the weapon was held to his throat. He still had both arms free, and he knew what he had to do. Gukiai, Senbenzakura Kagyoshi, he said, dropping his sword. Noitra's eyes widened. Are you fucking stupid? He shouted. A sphere of, of minuscule pink blades surrounded Noitra. There were no blind spots, and no points of escape. And yet there was a difference this time. Kuchiki Bayakuya was inside of the sphere. 
There are a hundred million blades within the sphere. If you not had not stated that you will go after Rukia next, I would have not forsaken the hurtless area, and would have likely defeated me regardless. However, since you have decided to go after my pride, I will not hesitate to sacrifice myself. We will both perish within the Gukiai. Bayakuya said. Noitra did not let him go. Fuck. The sphere converged on both combatants. There was an explosion of pink light, followed by an explosion, and the barracks of the 6th Division were destroyed. The explosion that the Gukiai caused made heads turn all around Soul Society, and made people pause in their battles to witness the display. Even the fellow captains were amazed at the display of power. When the blades dispersed, there were two figures in the center of the destruction. One of them was lying on the ground, a bloody mess. The other was standing upright, with only a few scratches upon him. Ha! You just threw your life away. What made you think that I would be any more affected by that attack than any of your others? You could have used Kidu or something to get out of that. Kuchiki Bayakuya, acting on his emotions. Never thought I'd see that with your reputation. I mentioned killing your sister for one minute, and you completely lose it. Noitra cackled. Bayakuya was on the ground, both his body and his captain's Hayori in shreds. There were streaks of blood all over his body, some of it leaking down into a puddle directly underneath. He was barely alive at this point. His Zanpakuta lay uselessly at his side. He could barely see the legs of the tall Arankar ominously walking up to him. Who man, I hope I get a more satisfying fight later on, because that was just downright pitiful. But you're a captain nonetheless, and it's my job to get rid of shitheads like you. I should be looking for your key right about now, but I think I should finish you off first. My key? That's what they are after, Bayakuya thought. He couldn't speak, for his throat was ruptured but the fact that they wanted his key was something that baffled him. He didn't even know what the key was for. He was just instructed by the captain commander to keep it safe at all times, lest he lose his position as captain. That's all he knew about it. I would ask you where it is, but you probably can't even talk by this point anyway, Neutra commented. He was practically talking to himself at this point. I hope Rukia manages to be safe, Bayakuya thought. As long as she survived this war, that was all that mattered to him. He could be at peace knowing that. Noitra was standing over him, casting a shadow over the fallen Bayakuya. He pointed his crescent-like Zanpakuta down at Bayakuya. It bore a remarkable resemblance to a guillotine. Bayakuya closed his eyes when he saw it, and Noitra crashed the blade down. What do you think you're doing, Zaraki? This is our territory. Huh. I don't see your name on it. Zaraki Kenpachi replied to the captain of the second division. There was a dispute on where each division was supposed to report to, which meant that the eleventh division was just doing what they felt like. Yeah, why don't you just go back to your division and work on that sneaking around that you second division was his love so much? Another eleventh division member piped up. Zaraki. Soifen hissed dangerously, to which Kenpachi only grinned. His hand was already on his Zanpakutu. Do you want to die? Soifen asked in anger. Kenpachi only grinned. Well, I've never fought with you before. If I can get a good fight out of it, then yeah, I wouldn't mind dying. Kenpachi said, swinging his Zanpakutu. The gust of wind that followed almost knocked back all of the second division members. You truly are insane, Zaraki Kenpachi. Even if this time of crisis, you betrayed the Godii 13 by seeing out a pointless fight. But if you wish to be put down for the sake of the Godii 13, then so be it. Now, now, let's not fight. You're both on the same side, are you not? Who's there? Show yourself. Soifen demanded to the strange voice. The voice decided to comply with her demands, and a few seconds after she said that, a large throne made of bones smashed onto a nearby roof as the two carriers descended towards the ground. There was a stocky old man reclining on the throne as his fraction carried it around, and just going by his appearance, he seemed like a king. Kenpachi and Soifen halted in their fight for a moment to take in the new arrival, and it didn't take Soifen long to realize he was an Arankar, and an enemy. Arankar? She shouted. Kenpachi witnessed her distress, 
and smiled a little wider when he realized that the old man in front of him was an enemy that he could fight. Soifen drew her blade, a wakizashi with a yellow hilt. She held it to the side almost like a kanai, trying to make herself look as threatening as possible. Who are you? The old man on the throne looked down at her with disdain. My name is Berrigan Lizenbairn, former king of Hueco Mundo and Cuarta Espada, he said simply. Soifen's eyes widened, not so much at his name or the fact that he was a former king, but something else. Espada? Berrigan raised an eyebrow, wrinkling his mustache slightly. You have heard of us? Color me surprised. His eyes trailed down to the two main opponents down there, before looking at the squad of Shinigami behind them. Unlike some of his comrades, he had not taken the time to educate himself on the captains of Soul Society, but he could tell when he saw one. Or two, in this case. Both of you seem to be captains judging from your Heoris and the fact that you are leading a fair number of underlings. Seems to be two opponents of captain class. It can't be helped, I suppose. I will just have to take on both of you at the same time. Berrigan stated, to the surprise of all the Shinigami. Never mind the arrogance, the Eleventh Division working together with anyone was a hoot in itself. You got sand for brains, old man? Why would the all-powerful Eleventh Division ever work together with these pussies? One of the lower-ranked members of the Eleventh Division pointed out. Shut up, you stupid kid. I wasn't talking to you. Barrigan roared. Even his fraction flinched when they heard Barrigan's voice boom like that, and when it did they kneeled down in front of his throne immediately. Barrigan sama we await your orders. Barrigan scratched his chin. Vega, Nerga, I order you two to take care of the refuse in the back. I will be the one to do battle with the two captains. Barrigan ordered, as Gio and Nerga saluted their commanding Espada and King. Hold your ground. Do not let them overcome you. Soifen ordered to her own men. The two fraction landed on the ground in a parallel line, and they casually walked up to the common soldiers. So, which do you want? Gio asked. Nerga contemplated this for a moment. The meatheads, he responded, clearly referring to the Eleventh Division. Gio nodded. He had wanted the ninja group anyway. This worked out in his favor. Bite it off, Tigre Estoke, he shouted, releasing his Zanpakutu. Over to the side, Nerga did a similar thing, transforming into a large, green mammoth hollow. The two Erenka flashed out of existence, stunning the Shinigami, except for the two captains. A large shadow appeared directly on top of the eleventh division members, rapidly growing larger before Nerga slammed down on the middle of the group, creating a large crater and a dozen dead Shinigami as the rest of them scattered. On the other side, Gio was slashing Shinigami to ribbons. TCH, garbage. Soifen thought, seeing her men fall so easily to a common errand car. She was about to intervene, but Berrigan appeared out of nowhere and grabbed her arm before she could even move. I believe I said that I am to be your opponent. Berrigan said dangerously. Kenpachi looked bored over on the side. He didn't care about the small fry over there. Doesn't matter to me. Though, can you fight? Kenpachi asked, pointing his blade at the old-looking errand car that was currently making a fool out of Soifen. Instead of answering that question, Berrigan returned to his throne, shoving a hand into the confines of the bones. A few seconds later, and he pulled out an enormous great axe from the throne, clearly his Zanpakutu. Kenpachi's grin became crazier when he saw it, but he was the only one who was happy about it. Soifen was absolutely livid after seeing her men get cut up by the Espada's subordinates. And now he had the audacity to humiliate her. The throne of bones disappeared in a flash of Ryoku, and Berrigan slammed into the tiled ground, cracking it and sending up large chunks. Soifen couldn't take it anymore. You bastard, she shouted, as she flashed away. She was about to attack him from the rear but once again it felt like she was slowed down as Berrigan grabbed her leg and slammed her into the ground. Without even changing his expression, he swung his great axe out, blocking the sword strike from Kenpachi, who had rushed in and attacked him right after he slammed Soifen into the ground. Berrigan blocked the attack, but the force of the swing was strong enough to almost cleave the down Soifen in two, who leapt out of the way at the last second. Zaraki, you bastard! 
she shouted. You're in the way. Get out of here. Kenpachi shouted back at his fellow captain. He clearly had no qualms about attacking her if she got in the way of his target. H.M.? You still insist on fighting with each other, even against an opponent whom you cannot hope to defeat alone? Berrigan mused, to which Kenpachi scoffed. Ha! I don't need her help to drop you. You haven't even shown me that you're worth more than a mild warm-up. Kenpachi shot back. Berrigan wrinkled his mustache. You're right. You both are captains after all, and so far I have only used my powers of time dilation against you. I suppose there is no point to holding back in the first place. Berrigan finished, withdrawing contact from Kenpachi's Zanpakutu. He angled his great axe Zanpakutu down towards the ground, and the red orb on the center opened, revealing it to be a giant red axe in the center of the axe. Red spiritual power rose off Berrigan and his Zanpakutu in waves. Rot. Arrogant. A wave of deep purple Ryatsu washed off Berrigan as it engulfed him. The dark void of Ryatsu covered him as if it were a cloak, shielding him from view from everyone around. His fraction and even the lower-ranked Shinigami paused to look at the terrifying display, and beads of sweat ran down their faces. Gio ripped out the jugular of another Shinigami using his release, but even he was terrified by the power that the Quarta Espada was displaying. I haven't seen him release his Zanpakutu in years. It's as terrifying as always. The Ririoka settled quickly, rapidly becoming the garb that encompassed Berrigan as he stepped out of the void. He had changed completely. He was now the complete visage of a skeleton, literally. A gold crown sat atop of his bony skull. Soifen was petrified, and even Kenpachi was standing still in place, though he was not afraid. He was just a little perplexed by Berrigan's appearance, as he had never seen anything like it. Respira, Berrigan said simply. He opened his mouth, and a deadly purple mist entered the air and spread out, particularly towards Soifen. The Respira rotted the tiled ground and the structures in its path towards the second division's captain. What is this? she said before she flashed away. Sting all enemies to death, Suzumabachi. She shouted as she appeared directly behind Berrigan. She was about to go in for the, the kill, but she noticed a very subtle mist hovering around Berrigan, so she backed off at the last second. If I so much as touch him, I will probably be rotted away like the ground. I need to keep my distance for the time being. Her eyes flicked over to Kenpachi, who was still standing in place. Damn Zaraki isn't going to be of any help, she thought. Her shirkai was a close-range weapon only which meant that it was practically disabled against an opponent like him. Agwaf. She looked over to the right as Kenpachi gave an ecstatic battle cry and rushed his opponent. Berrigan sensed him coming, though no one could tell what he was thinking underneath his hollow gaze. Idiot. Soifin spat at the 11th Division's captain. She had to do something, before the Godii 13 lost the captain to the enemy. She may have despised Zaraki but he was useful to the Godii 13. Bakudo number 61, Rikujukuru, she said, casting the powerful Bakudo spell. Six rods of light materialized out of thin air, slamming into Kenpachi's midsection and pinning him in place. What the? Kenpachi complained. That likely wouldn't hold him for long, but it would keep him from running in and killing himself for the time being while she distracted the errand car. Soifen. What the fuck do you think you're doing using pussy shit kid on me? Kenpachi griped. Soifen ignored him for the time being. She would have one shot to finish this. Oh? It would be much more efficient for you to attack two on one, though I will commend you for your quick thinking. If that brute would have continued, he would be a pile of dust by now. Yet you have disabled your only usable ally. Or perhaps you have another trick up your sleeve? Berrigan remarked. I don't have time to wrap the Jinjuhan around any structure of support. Looks like I'll have to take the entire recoil at once. If it can destroy this Aaron car, then so be it, she thought. She raised the stinger on her hand into the air. Bankai. Golden yellow Ryatsu exploded off of Soifen as her small shirk eye reformed into something that was much larger. When the Ryatsu dispersed, a giant missile launcher was being supported by her right arm. Jakoho Reikaben. 
Berrigan watched the powerful weapon with a slight amount of unease, though Kenpachi was still struggling. Oi, Soifen! Stop hogging all the fun for yourself. You're gonna use your bank eye on him? Everyone, move out of here now. Vacate the area. That's an order, Soifen shouted. However, when she turned around, she was disheartened to see that most of her forces had already been annihilated. There was a dead Nerga upon the ground, but Geo was still alive and kicking, and was now making a mess of both divisions' forces. Soifen growled. Her forces were already running away in the face of such danger. Well, the less people that see it the better, she commented. She still hated her bankai. It was the first time she had used it in years, and none of her division had ever actually seen her use it before. She raised the golden cylinder and aimed it, the slits in her face guard allowing her pinpoint aim. Eat this. An eruption of fire emerged from the back end, and the bankai fired a large missile from its case, which went rocketing through the air, tracking its target down. Berrigan grunted as the fast-moving projectile moved towards his vantage point on the roof. Underneath his mask, he was grinning completely as he used his even stronger time dilation field to move himself away from where the explosion would hit. The missile burst into an enormous explosion of force and fire. Berrigan just stood away from the blast, not being affected by the recoil in the slightest. However, the Bankai had an adverse effect on its master— the recoil being even stronger because she did not wrap the Jinjuhan around herself like she normally did when using it. The blast hit her with a lesser force, knocking her back with an unrestrained ferocity as she flew through several buildings. Blood emerged from the corner of her mouth as she took a beating and came to a halt almost two blocks away from where she fired her bank eye. Berrigan just stood on the roof and watched as the recoil hit her at full force. Down below, Kenpachi had not even been budged by the attack though he did seem a little excited that Soifen was able to pack such a punch. His own natural strength and the force of the blast had helped him brush off the kid she had put on him. The rods that bound him disappeared, as mobility returned to his body once again. Finally, I'm free of that annoying kidu. Looks like Soifen did some stupid bank eye trick that didn't even scratch you, and now she's dug herself a hole in the ground afterwards. So I guess I'll take you on now. Berrigan hummed. A brute that only charges in and attacks physically. Someone like that can never hope to defeat me. Berrigan explained to him, to which Kenpachi just grinned wider. Hat so, huh? Well, don't blame me when you end up dying. Kenpachi charged Berrigan. In response, Berrigan withdrew a slimmer version of the axe he had when he was unreleased. He blocked Kenpachi's attack with ease, but that wasn't the main point. While he had locked blades with Kenpachi, he exhaled Respira from his mouth yet again. The fingers on Kenpachi's hand began to rot away, but when Kenpachi saw this, he only grinned. He stepped back from Berrigan and quickly sliced off his entire hand without hesitation, watching it rot away into dust. Berrigan watched with amusement as the one-handed Kenpachi looked even more pumped up after that display. Man, that breath of yours is annoying. How am I supposed to beat you if I can't even get close? Kenpachi said. Apparently he wasn't as stupid as he looked. Berrigan was about to attack him once again, but he picked up a strong Ryatsu getting closer and closer to him. He was apparently near where the other captain had been knocked back towards. Once they split up into Soul Society, he could isolate his target. No one around to help him there. He was going to take over this operation now and reclaim his rightful place as the true leader of Hollows. Well, are you ready to start round two? Kenpachi asked. Even with one hand, he was still fearsome. He looked about ready to take off his eye patch, but he wouldn't get the chance now. Berrigan said nothing, because he wasn't interested in Kenpachi anymore. Without even responding to him, Berrigan disappeared onto the wind in a sonido, leaving Kenpachi there alone. That didn't kill the bastard. He has some trick up his sleeve that I haven't grasped yet, but what is it? Soifen asked herself, frustrated by her lack of progress. She had broken a few bones during the recoil as she slammed through building after building, before she finally came to rest a few blocks away from the scene by crashing into a wall. She coughed up blood dangerous, dragging herself to her feet as she panted. A few cuts and scrapes and broken bones, but she could still fight. 
she hefted her bank eye over her shoulder. I have to get back there and defeat him now. She was about to flash back to the area where she had fought the skeletal Arankar. But before she could even move, Berrigan had appeared over her before she could even move. I don't understand. What are your powers? She had the audacity to ask the Arankar before her, who merely regarded her with a neutral look. Her mind was working on overdrive, and she still didn't get it. You don't get it, do you? Berrigan's kingly voice boomed. The ten espadas each represent an aspect of death. In other words, those are the reasons why people die. Each espada's power or personality reflects that in some way. Emptiness. Sacrifice. Loneliness. Rage. Madness. Intoxication. Destruction. Despair. Betrayal. And the aspect that I embody is old age. Time, if you will. That is what my power is. Something that everyone must face, and no one can escape from. He lifted the bruised soyfin up by her neck. He was surprisingly strong with just being bones. I use time to slow down your movements, and I use time to avoid your attacks. My respira is also an example of my use of time. His grip tightened on her. Do not try to resist. Resisting is an affront of God. I will control your life, and I shall control how you die. I have domain over all living things, and they are there to be bent to my will. Because I am a god. Berrigan mused. Now die. He released more respira, and Soyfant screamed in agony. Her flesh was being rotted away before her very eyes as Berrigan's respira took its toll on her. First her throat rotted in dust, but the dying woman was still alive until her internal organs were rotted away. Her flesh, muscles, and organs all rotted away from the respira. She was already dead by that point. Berrigan continued to rot her down even as she was a skeleton. He had completely reduced her to a pile of dust. He felt the dust wash through his bony fingers, but he didn't feel satisfied with that kill. Not at all. He did not come to this exact location to kill the captain he had fought just a few minutes ago. Man, again with all that god crap. Don't you ever fucking get tired of it? Naruto. Berrigan spat out the word with an intense amount of hatred. Well, thanks to that, I managed to get the keys for both the 2nd and 11th divisions. Naruto was currently lying on his stomach on top of the wall overlooking Berrigan his head and shoulders hanging off the side as he reclined up there, apparently relaxed. He pulled two identical golden keys from his pocket. One of them had the kanji for two on it, and the other had the kanji for eleven. So I suppose I should thank you for getting rid of one of the captains, but question remains, what are you going to do now? Naruto asked. Berrigan said nothing. For a few seconds, everyone was silent. But then Berrigan threw his powerful Grand Kata axe directly at Naruto's head. The axe spun in the air at an incredible rate, pulverizing the wall that Naruto was reclining on. So, it's going to come down to that, huh? And here I thought we could make up and be friends. Naruto said happily, making mushy and exaggerated kissy noises. He was now standing on the wall adjacent to the one that had been destroyed. Silence. It is your fault that I lost my kingdom in the first place, and even now you insist to be leader. I am God. I am the rightful king. Not some stupid brat that doesn't even know how to rule. Hey, don't pin the loss of your kingdom on me. I may have weakened it severely, but it was Aizen who came in and gave it the final blow, you realize. Naruto admonished. Shut up, you stupid brat. You or Aizen, it makes no difference. I will have you destroyed. Berrigan shouted madly. Naruto sighed, before he grinned maniacally. I guess we couldn't avoid this. Looking back, you were the first tangible enemy I fought from the time I became a hollow. Before Soul Society, before Aizen, before Konoha, it was you. I'm surprised we've managed to work together for so long, but you've always hated me, haven't you? That hasn't changed. Though, you wouldn't even be in this situation if you had killed me all those years ago, but you let me live for some stupid-ass competition because you were bored. And I gave you exactly that. I bet you hate yourself right about now, don't you? Naruto taunted. Sayalin-sensei. Berrigan screamed, 
chucking his axe at Naruto yet again. Chapter 53, Respira The axe that Barrigan threw obliterated yet another chunk of wall that Naruto had decided to take refuge on. This time, however, he did not flit to another section of wall, but instead leapt off the crumbling wall onto the tiled ground, ready to face Barrigan. That blow was strong enough to puncture even his hiero. Perhaps he should have demoted Barrigan further, or at least he should have went lackluster on his training over the past few years if he had known that this was going to happen. The Grand Kata axe whirled through the air, whipping around like a boomerang as it flew back towards Barrigan's hands. It seemed like it was headed directly into Naruto's position on its way back. A forceful gust of wind from the axe destroyed a few more bricks along the walls and the surrounding area, but the Primera wasn't phased by the apparently powerful weapon. Naruto closed his eyes wistfully, placing his hand on his hip, drawing his Zanpakutu from its sheath and blocking the oncoming axe with his very first strike. He manipulated it upwards so it missed Naruto completely, and was then caught by Barrigan. I'm going to kill you here, you insect, after all these long years, he said. His voice was incredibly low-pitched, but Naruto could easily feel the hatred that existed in Barrigan's tone. Barrigan then gave Naruto a short half-lidded stare, his eyes dangerously shaded. I'm going to take control of your army. Naruto! Barrigan roared, releasing all of his riatsu. It rocketed higher, and higher, and higher, until it was practically palpable in the atmosphere. Naruto didn't flinch. You'll regret allowing me even greater power. He pointed his Grand Keita axe at the ground, similar to how his first release worked. Resurrection Arrogant, Segunda Etapa. His spiritual pressure grew larger still, as the mist morphed Barrigan's first Resurrection into something even more terrifying. But Naruto was ready for him completely. When Barrigan emerged from the mist of Ryatsu, his cloak was longer. Whereas before he at least a little bit form fitting, it now was heavy and flowing with at least a few feet of excess. He looked even more the visage of a god of death. It covered his body completely but Naruto always wondered whether he even had a body underneath all that excess of robe. Besides his robe, there were thick black strands of material coming out of his back like tree branches, making Barrigan look even more gnarled and old. His face was shielded by a thick black hood. His crown was integrated into the black linen. Barrigan was silent for a moment, before he reached into his expansive cloak and pulled out two enormous axes, similar in shape to Grand Kata but easily bigger. Bringing out the big guns early, I see. Well, I don't suppose I can blame you. Naruto commented, as Barrigan rubbed his two axes against each other, creating a loud grinding noise. You will regret the steps I have taken to become stronger. You are no match for me. Barrigan shouted again. To Naruto, this just seemed like one giant gloat fest. Naruto was twirling his Zanpakuto on his finger. Yeah, yeah? So are we gonna start or what? I've got another old fucker to hunt down, you know. Naruto said half-heartedly, catching his Zanpakuto by its hilt. I know what you're capable of, Barrigan. We've been over this before. Your ability within your resurrection, Segunda Etapa would be near impossible to avoid if you didn't know what it was. But unfortunately for you, I do. Naruto lectured. He was lecturing to nobody, however, for Barrigan was ready to begin attacking and was not listening to Naruto ramble in the slightest. He held both of his axes out, and upon closer inspection it was revealed that they weren't completely identical. The one in his right hand was closer in resemblance to his sealed Zanpakutu, being incredibly large, bulky, and just generally powerful. There was a red crest in the center. The one in his left hand was a different story. It was smaller and more streamlined, much more similar in appearance to his Grand Kata from his first release. To complement the other axe, however, there was a blue crest also in the center. For a split second, Barrigan released his respira and waited. The area around him rotted, but the dying breath dispersed almost immediately, leaving a very small amount of space decayed. Barrigan was not releasing any respira at that point forward. A dark point of Ryatsa materialized on the very tip of the blade of his larger axe spreading outward and covering it like a glue. With a quick grunt, he swung his axe horizontally at where Naruto was standing. Naruto contemplated swinging his sword at the oncoming wave of force. 
He reached for his Zanpakutu, but... Not! Naruto cried childishly, moving out of the way of the oncoming force. The force from Barrigan's swing crackled in the air right at the spot where Naruto had been standing not even a second earlier. When it hit that spot, all of the material within a certain radius began to rot and decay. Even the air began to turn an unhealthy yellowish color as it too rotted underneath Barrigan's ability. You've really developed that ability of yours with your second release. I doubt it will be enough, though. Naruto commented. Barrigan swung his axe three times in a crisscross formation, creating three more areas where the world began to rot underneath the influence of Respira. Using that axe, you can do more than just limit Respira to a small field around yourself. Wherever you swing that axe at, your Respira is transported to the pinpointed area at which you swung. Every time. Without fail. And that's just the ability of one of your axes. Naruto commented. Barrigan continued to hack away. A few times he set up a trap. He knew that Naruto was going to continue dodging, so he used his initial attack as a diversion to lure him into an area he had already marked with his Respira. Naruto saw through it fairly easily. He avoided every single trap that Barrigan set for him, nimbly keeping himself on the move while keenly pointing out any traps that Barrigan may have set. Rot. Decay. Die. Barrigan chanted, letting loose a rapid flurry of swings that coated his range with respira fields. Naruto noticed that no matter what happened, he couldn't swing his axe more than six times without recoiling. There's the opening. Naruto surmised, taking the split second where Barrigan recoiled from his own strikes and faltered in his battle stance just a little bit. There was a field of respira ahead of him, though there was a clear path to Barrigan that he could touch without being rotted away. He darted through the area before the respira could fully disperse, holding out his Zanpakutu to attack. However, he didn't clash blades with Barrigan. He knew he had to refrain from getting too close to the former king seeing how he still had his Respira force field around him. If he clashed blades with Barrigan, he would lose his Zanpakutu. He concentrated his Ciro on the tip of the blade, retaliating when Barrigan swung his Zanpakutu at the oncoming Naruto. Naruto ducked under it nimbly, bending his knees and dodging it almost like he was doing the limbo, retaining himself within that position. He pointed a finger as close as he could at Barrigan, firing a quick bala from his index finger. The flash blinded Barrigan momentarily, causing Barrigan to recoil in surprise and allowing Naruto to stand up. He swung his blade, firing the Ciro he had charged onto his blade in a downward strike upon Barrigan. Little chunks of bone, cloth, and orange riatsa mixed in a giant explosion of force as Naruto's attack took off a fair chunk of Barrigan's body. Still, that amount of damage would only result in Barrigan getting angrier. Whoa! Naruto cried out as Barrigan retaliated with a reckless swing of his axe. Naruto flopped away from the scene lightly, moving away from the respira that followed and landing on one knee ten feet away from it. Despite being pushed back, he smiled. He pointed both of his index fingers at Barrigan, like he was pointing a childish finger gun at Barrigan. However, an orange blip appeared on the ends of his fingers. Bala Rapida Barrigan grunted as Naruto fired rapid ballast out of his index fingers at breakneck speeds. He dodged to the right, running along the ground as he just missed the quick ballast that Naruto was still shooting. Naruto halted for a moment, throwing his palm out as he shot a Ciro in a split second, throwing off the momentum that he had had earlier. Barrigan jumped at the explosion of Ryoku, this time holding out his blue crested axe. Naruto flashed into the air using Sonido but Barrigan was prepared for him to do just that. He gathered Ryatsu around his second axe, chuckling to himself as Naruto prepared to avoid his oncoming attack. Too naive. Barrigan remarked to himself. His blue-crested axe glowed with Ryatsu, as the blue crest on the center cracked underneath the pressure. A split second later, and Naruto was standing on the ground, like he had never moved into the air. He looked slightly surprised but for someone whose time had just been undone, he looked far less shocked that he should have. Renesimiento. Have you forgotten who helped you develop that ability in the first place? A frustrated Naruto pointed out, to which Barrigan swung his axe again. Naruto was now standing exactly where he had been when he had charged Barrigan earlier. 
In other words, he was as close as he could possibly get without being rotted away. Naruto grit his teeth in annoyance at his situation, but Barrigan was already trying to attack him with his regular respira. Whenever he tried to flash away from Barrigan, he would be brought right back to where he was with Renesimiento. Son of a bitch. Naruto cursed. A wave of respira was about to wash all over him, making sure that there would be absolutely nothing left when he was done. You're really going to force me to use my ability? Naruto said incredulously. Barrigan's ability was a little hard to deal with for a fighter like him, but to be pushed to this level was astounding. Die, Naruto! Naruto smirked before he charged up his orange riatsu into his hand. He waved his arm around in a quick circle, before the riatsu on his hand glowed ever brighter. When Naruto reached out his arm, the cloud of riatsu formed into a solid-like form, which was seemingly directed around Naruto to avoid him completely. Naruto was continuing to perform strange motions with his hands and arms, and in response to them the wave of respira that was meant for him hovered harmlessly a safe distance behind Naruto. I see. Riatsu and Ririoka manipulation, the signature ability of your unreleased state, though I have heard that you use it so rarely that only a few living beings have ever seen you use it. Barrigan commented. Naruto didn't respond to his comments, but as he was standing in his position, while holding a rigid stance, the respira behind him soared into the air. Naruto waited for just one second, before he shot his arm out horizontally. The wave of Respira shot down at Barrigan, washing over its own master. However, it either passed through or passed over the Quarta Espada as if it were harmless water. Of course he wouldn't be affected by it. He had his own little tricks that protected him from his own power. Using it against him would be out of the question for the time being. Fool, did you honestly believe anything would happen when you tried that? Barrigan asked. The respira that Naruto had redirected back at Barrigan began to settle, but Naruto didn't lose his stance. Barrigan swung his blue-crested axe at the dissipating respira, and within a second it was back to normal, ready to be used by Barrigan to decay things. However, this time, Barrigan was doing something a little bit different. He was manipulating both of his axes in a bizarre fashion, like he was going to do something in tandem with them. Kaja del Tiempo he thrust his red-crested axe forward, followed by his blue one. Oh, crap. Naruto noted. The miasma that was the respira was taking a new shape, and as more mist fell off of Barrigan's body, it got larger and larger, until it was beginning to form a gigantic sphere. Barrigan wasn't done at that point either. He swung his blue axe harder, allowing his red riatsu to wash off of him. It merged with the gigantic ball of respira. Naruto looked uncertain on how to avoid or combat the gigantic ball of death and decay, because this was of the few tricks in Barrigan's arsenal that he had never seen before. The Kaja del Tiempo swelled to an enormous size, to the point where Naruto didn't even know how it kept its shape. At this point, Barrigan stopped adding Respira and Ririoku to the ball. Rot for eternity, Naruto! Barrigan roared, swinging both of his axes at the exact same time. Naruto tried to avoid the oncoming ball of Respira, but it was far too large and far too quick. There was a loud crack that resonated throughout Soul Society as Naruto was engulfed by the sphere. Even Shinigami who were nowhere near the site were blown away by the sheer force that Barrigan's attack had created. It obliterated a good chunk of the street, but Naruto himself wasn't subject to such destructive force. Barrigan stood in safety away from the blast regarding the Kaja del Tiempo as it crackled and swirled. Underneath his hood and skull-like visage, Barrigan seemed oddly satisfied, which was bizarre for the usually grumpy Erenkar. You should have kept closer tags on your subordinates, Naruto Uzumaki. You may have allowed me access to the Segunda Etapa, but I have developed this technique in secret, for the sole purpose of defeating you. I will never forgive you, Naruto. I have bided my time for so long, waiting for this moment, when I could imprison you within my Kaja del Tiempo. When I disperse it into a pocket dimension, you will know suffering as you constantly aged and revitalized over eternity. Barrigan threw his arms out, dropping both of his axes, which both stuck into the ground. He spread his arms out like he was an eagle, and he cackled in merriment. And now for the grand finale. He clenched his fist, 
and the Caja del Tiempo began to ripple. It imploded upon itself, shrinking in size until there was nothing but a small blip in the air, which also disappeared. Within the Caja del Tiempo, Naruto wasn't perturbed. By all means, he should have been succumbing to the effects of eternal time acceleration and reversal, but he wasn't. He was breathing a little bit heavily, but he was not injured, and his body wasn't rotting away. He hadn't expected something like this to be in Berrigan's arsenal, but at its core it was something he could deal with. His hands were charged with orange riatsu, and were thrust out to the side. He had sheathed his zanpakutu. He was manipulating the riatsu and ryoku around him, creating a protective bubble around himself that protected him from the powerful attack. However, this was almost as much as he could handle at one time. He rotated his arms around, keeping the protective casing around him intact. He could just barely see Berrigan standing outside the miasma of Riatsu and Mist. He was getting ready to finish the technique. The respira began to converge on him, and if even the slightest bit of it touched him, he would be trapped within the sphere for eternity. He relaxed for just a moment, breathing in and out as an idea came to him. For just a split second, he eliminated the protective casing he had creating with his Ryatsu manipulation powers, allowing the flow of Respira to converge on him. However, he redirected his power into his right hand, creating an open path out of the sphere that he dove for instantaneously. While he was moving out of the Kaja del Tiempo, his left hand was working a far more intricate technique. At the end of his finger, he used his own riatsu and gathered a tiny portion of the respira and stably held it in the palm of his left hand so it wasn't touching his skin. Outside, as the Kaja del Tiempo collapsed into nothing, Naruto crashed out of the sphere unharmed, flopping onto the ground a distance away from Barrigan. When he landed on the ground, he fired a siro from his free hand. Barrigan redirected it easily using one of his axes, but a standard attack wasn't why Naruto fired it. It was to gauge Berrigan's reaction. A Cyril was probably unnecessary for what he was about to do, though. He just needed to hit him with a fast attack, and if that was the case, a bala would work perfectly. Berrigan held a surprised posture as he noticed for the first time that Naruto had survived his ultimate attack, and there was nothing more he could do at this point. Unless he could find an attack that would be effective on Naruto, he was going to lose this battle. Naruto's left hand was disabled for the time being until he could get an opening, but he drew his zanpaka to once again with his free hand. He waved it around in a snake-like fashion, manipulating the respira that naturally exuded from Berrigan, and practically taking its control from him. Berrigan created more respira in response, but he was still annoyed that Naruto was able to sap control from him so easily. He kept on trying and kept on failing to regain control from Naruto. You little brat. Berrigan roared in anger, when he realized that his respira was now useless. He then charged Naruto, using his time dilation to get a quick edge, readying both his axes in an attempt to take off Naruto's head. Now! Naruto screamed to himself within his own mind. He swung his sword one more time, creating a wall of riatsu that shrouded him from view and hindered Berrigan's vision. A quick sonido later, and Naruto had appeared behind Berrigan. He quickly charged up a bala in his left hand, which was the hand that contained his captured riatsu. He shoved his hand as close to Berrigan's face as he possibly could while the other espada was still blindsided to him, releasing the bala. Berrigan dodged at the last second, but the bala caught just a little bit of his hood. Naruto dispersed the cloud of respira as Berrigan retreated farther away from him, looking satisfied. That attack was all he needed. Berrigan took a knee and shoved one of his axes into the ground again. Naruto was already sheathing his sword. Berrigan hummed in confusion. The match is over, Berrigan. You're dead. Naruto mentioned. Hmm. Your attack missed me, brat. Don't think you can kill a god so easily. Berrigan said. Naruto said nothing, but instead just raised his finger and pointed at Berrigan. You don't know what I did when I was in your Kaja del Tiempo, do you? Berrigan looked confused for a moment, until he noticed that his hood was beginning to rot. I know all about your power of Respira. You have complete control over it, and it would be hard to use it against you, but even you can't stand up to it in the end. When I was inside your sphere, 
I used my control over Ryatsu to take just a little bit of your respira as my own. I mixed it in with that last bala I fired, the one that singed your hood was just a distraction so you wouldn't notice that your own power was underneath it. Why you bastard? Barrigan grunted. He threw his axe out of desperation at Naruto, hoping for a clean kill. Yet Naruto ducked underneath it easily, and raised an eyebrow at Barrigan. Are you sure there isn't one last thing you haven't noticed yet? The respira was beginning to rot away Barrigan's body but it wasn't as effective as normal. Your renascimento power is also tempered in with that respira. I took your riatsa from within the Kaja del Tiempa, meaning you are not meant to rot away from respira, but are instead meant to suffer from Kaja del Tiempo. Barrigan seemed to realize it only when Naruto explained it to him, but at this point it was too late. The little blip of riatsa that Naruto had collected within the sphere had now swelled to a greater size and was rotting away Barrigan's skeletal body in front of his own eyes. Barrigan fell to his knees as the Kaja del Tiempo worked at magic. It was restoring one part of Barrigan's body while simultaneously decaying the rest, in an endless cycle of agony that Barrigan had developed himself. You worthless brat. I let you live all those years ago, and this is how you repay me. I won't die, I'll never die. Not until you are destroyed by my royal axes. Barrigan shouted manically, as the respira engulfed him. His voice became muffled as the respira began to disappear to the pocket dimension from whence it came, and Naruto was left staring at nothing but empty space as it disappeared completely. Barrigan was nowhere to be seen. Naruto put a hand to his chin, grinning lightly before breaking out into a psychotic laugh. He hadn't had that much fun in a fight for a while now, and he was just waiting for an excuse to put down that old fuck. Still, his contributions had been useful, and that was why he had avoided it for so long. And he was down to just Ada Spada now, with the Zero Division looming closer. Hopefully he didn't lose any more before he had to fight them. That delayed me a little more than it should have. I need to find the other old fuck I'm supposed to kill. Naruto commented, leaving the scene where he had fought Barrigan. Hey, what's with this crap? I didn't know a dog could be a captain. That's weird. Yami babbled to himself. Kamamura stood there in silent fury as his bankai fought with the giant Arankar. Kamamura swung the hilt of his sword over his head, and his bankai mimicked his movements. Yami adopted a look of confusion on his face, as the giant armor swung its massive blade down on Yami's head. Yami clapped his hands together over the blade. The blade created a shallow wound on Yami's forehead but the decima was more than strong enough to mostly stop it in its tracks. Did you think that would work? Yami guffawed, throwing off the blade and punching the giant. The giant used its fanbraces to block the punch via Kamamura's movements. Kamamura growled in anger. Even though he blocked the attack, this Arankar was apparently strong enough to send his giant skidding back several feet, and he felt himself move back along with it. Yami laughed. Fucking ant. Just cause you have some giant weapon doesn't mean you'll be able to beat me. Yami opened his mouth incredibly widely, as a siro formed in his mouth. It was like his unreleased siro, but to accommodate his size, the beam was far larger, and would definitely destroy at a far greater rate. Kamamura sensed it coming, and he gripped his sword with two hands. The giant once again mimicked his movements, and as Yami fired the siro, Kamamura's giant cut through the energy easily parting them like water as they harmlessly missed the giant bankai. Yami raised one of his many, many legs to kick the bankai, but Kamamura was quicker. He sliced the leg at a vertical angle, lopping off the large appendage and unbalancing Yami slightly. However, there were many more legs where that came from. You insect! At this point, Yami stopped trying to fight with Kamamura's giant, and instead went straight for Kamamura himself, trying to stomp him out of his existence. He brought his foot down on the 7th Division's captain, and at first it seemed like Kamamura had died. Yami was left perplexed when he felt Kamamura struggling underneath his foot, using his great strength to pry off the giant Espada. Yami grunted as Kamamura lifted him off the ground completely and threw him. His massive weight was enough that he wasn't thrown far, but he landed with a thud and destroyed several alleys and almost crushed a few Shinigami. All around the Suryaidei, it seemed like a massive earthquake hit all the Shinigami at once. 
Even some of the other captains and Espada paused when the giant Erenkar flopped onto the ground. Kamamura didn't waste any time in exploiting the opening that was created when Yami went down. He gripped the hilt of his Zanpakutu, and his giant Bankai did the same thing with its giant blade. He slashed down as if he were an executioner carrying out punishment, aiming for Yami's thick neck. Yami's eyes snapped open at the right moment, and he pounded his fists together, catching the blade in its tracks. He was getting angrier from the resistance, and there was a barely noticeable change in appearance. His muscles were slightly larger in fact. He pushed upwards, slowly shifting his legs out to sweep the giant's feet. The giant stumbled in place, and Yami used the opportunity to push on the giant blade. The blade flew out of the giant's hand, and in turn the hilt flew out of Kamamura's hand. Unarmed, the giant was no match for Yami, and even the unintelligent Erenkar knew this. A giant grin split onto Yami's face, and he shot his giant fist out. The giant Bankai was far too slow to outmaneuver it, and even though Yami's fist was slow, there was enough force behind to nearly cave the giant's face in. As far as Kamamura was concerned, he felt it as well. Whatever damage was done to the giant was done to him as well, and he could feel blood leaking from his nose and mouth as he skidded in place along the ground. Him, getting outclassed in strength? That didn't make any sense. Tai Cho Kamamura looked over to the side, and he recognized about a dozen members of his own division standing not too far from where he had skidded towards. They were apparently rushing someplace, but with his Bankai and the Erenkar in the way and causing such destruction they couldn't really get to their destination. What are you all doing? Suri IDI is under attack. Kamamura scolded. He knew that it probably wasn't their fault, but in a time of crisis, he couldn't really afford to be so fair. The Shinigami recruits seemed nervous or afraid from his words, and they didn't say anything. They kept looking at the destroyed streets and giant fighters that loomed in front of them. We'll back you up, Kamamura Taishu, one brave Shinigami said, putting his hand on his Zanpakutu. A bead of sweat was rolling down his face as he kept glancing at Yami, so it was obvious he really didn't want to back up Kamamura. No, you can't. This is an espada. None of you will be a match for him, and I can't fight while protecting you. There are other, low-level Erenkar that are terrorizing Suryidei at the moment. If anything, engage them in combat, Kamamura ordered. Huh? What are you doing over here? And what's with all the weak bugs? Yami asked, scratching his head as he noticed them all standing far away from him. He raised his club-like tail as Kamamura shouted to his division members. Get out of here! Go now! He roared. It was too late. Yami swung his large tail around, catching the dozen or so seven division members from the size. A few of them were unlucky enough to be hit by the club-like part of tail. The members were knocked back, and several of them died on impact. Now Kamamura was angrier than ever. Using his fairly weak shunpa, he flashed over to where the hilt of his sword had fallen, snatching it up quickly as his giant bankai retrieved its own sword. Not wasting any time, he slashed upwards and then downwards in a series of quick strikes. The attack created a large gash diagonally down from Yami's shoulder, and it had also cracked his mask. Yami wheezed and howled in pain, cursing at Kamamura as he did so. He glowed with an angry red riatsu, and his muscles bulged again. You fucking insect! Don't you know by now? Your pathetic attempts at attacking will only make me angrier, and the angrier I get, the more powerful I become. Don't think that you're even a match for me. The Riatsa was like a blanket, and Yami released a punch far more devastating than normal onto Kamamura's Bankai. Naruto pulled out the two keys that he had gathered. Berrigan had done well, even if he did rebel against him in the long run. He managed to kill a captain and provide him enough to grab the keys. The other Espada had probably at least grabbed a few of them, but for now, he had to go find Yamamoto. He had studied Yamamoto's file extensively, poring over every single detail. He knew the old Shinigami's personality, combat abilities, and intelligence, as well as anything else he was capable of. He had already covered a lot of ground, making his way to the first division barracks and offices high above the rest of Siri IDI. At his vantage point on the scaffolding high above, 
he could see the destruction that his forces were wreaking all over Syriadei. It was a beautiful sight. He leaned over the balcony for a moment, sighing wistfully. He rolled his eyes over to the left when he heard several swords being unsheathed and gripped. His own sword was still out. He had never put it away after his fight with Berrigan. He half-heartedly twirled it around in his hand, pondering his next course of action. Halt! You are under arrest, Aaron Carr, a stern voice said. Naruto closed his eyes in embarrassment. Arrest him? Seriously? He wasn't trying to go for the kill immediately? That's what was wrong with these Shinigami. They had the kill-first attitude when it came to normal hollows, so why not the Aaron Carr? who were basically hollow in disguise. Was it because they looked human? He laid eyes on the Shinigami who spoke for the first time, and he perked up. There were around eight nameless Shinigami surrounding a decorated Shinigami who was clearly of importance. First Division Vice Captain, Sasakai Chujuru. Naruto said, laughing a little bit. Sasakai said nothing. You're the old fox golden boy, right? I know all about how you're captain level but you refused to leave his side out of loyalty. Naruto remarked. He had of course read the file on Sasakai as well, as well as the very peculiar relationship he had with his direct superior. Sasakai looked a little bothered now. He was obviously wondering how the Arankar could possibly know that. You and Yamamoto are like two peas in a pod. Superior and subordinate. You're a combination that is legendary even in Hueco Mundo. So that means, he trailed off and he voice became lower and incredibly dangerous as he fixed all the Shinigami in front of him with a look of pure lunacy, like an Arankar possessed. All the Shinigami backed away in fear. All of them, except for Sasakai. That means, if I kill you, the old man will go ballistic, right? Naruto almost shrieked the last part. One of the Shinigami dropped his Zanpakutu out of fright, and Naruto attacked. His blinding Sonido caught everyone off guard including Sasakai. He spun his Zanpakutu around his head almost like a strange dance, and it was so strong it conjured up a gust of wind. A split second later, and Naruto was kneeling towards the ground directly behind the group of Shinigami. Eight of them had been slashed through the middle, blood gurgling in their mouths as they dropped their Zanpakutu. They hadn't even seen it coming. Only Sasakai had managed to successfully block the attack, his shirkai already activated as he grunted underneath the force of the attack. It had been a long time since anyone had forced him to use his true strength. Oh, I guess you would survive that one. You're not prized by the old fucker for nothing, I suppose. Too bad your subordinates didn't seem as highly trained as you. Naruto mentioned. You, you keep spouting off things that should be secret. How do you know all these things? Sasakai demanded. Oh, you learn a few things after being under the thumb of Aizen Sasuk for so long, but that's not the point. You might as well bring out your Bankai for this. He flashed forward, and before Sasakai could even react, he had a blade pointed at his throat. You're gonna need it. Sasakai flashed his sword upward, parrying Naruto's blade and almost knocking it out of his hands. Naruto thrust forward as he did so, but Sasakai escaped with only a minor wound to the neck which blood trickled down from. You fiend, you even know about that, he said, darting forward with both hands on his blade. Naruto stepped forward, and in a flashy movement clashed his blade against Sasakai's recklessly with one hand, throwing his free arm back and with a little flourish parried Sasakai's sword. While Sasakai was recoiling, Naruto clutched his blade and thrust forward with a stab, which caught Sasakai just barely in the side as he tried to move to the left to avoid it. Naruto shoved his free hand right into Sasakai's space, charging up a Ciro Venenoso in his hand. Sasakai could practically taste the acrid feel of it on his face, and he could feel his skin start to peel off from it. Bala Rapida The Ciro Venenoso disappeared in an instant, and in its place were little blips of light that fired rapidly from the tips of Naruto's index finger. The attack didn't seem to work, but Sasakai was now well aware of the threat that this Arankar was. Naruto clashed blades with him again, and this time he managed to knock his Zanpakutu out of his hand. Following up with a quick thrust, he caught Sasakai through the stomach. Sasakai barely cried out in pain, but he fell back immediately when he realized the danger that he was in. 
He scooped up his shirkai and didn't waste any time in responding. Bankai. Kukukanryu Rikyu. Sasakai was surrounded in a cage of lightning bolts which was held together by a dome of lightning. The area around the two fighters became dark as storm clouds entered the vicinity high above. A single bolt of lightning extended from the dome up into the sky. Naruto hummed thoughtfully. Sasakai said nothing, directing his hands. As he did so, a strong bolt of lightning struck Naruto from the sky above, obliterating the bridge they were standing on and splitting it in two. Sasakai took refuge on the balcony near the other side, watching the dust settle. He flinched when the dead body of a Shinigami, one that Naruto had killed earlier, came flying up him out of nowhere. A bolt of lightning struck the body, but it only ended up charring it as it broke the barrier and collided with him. Sasakai pushed it out of the way and regained his vision, but it was all too late. Too easy, Naruto said. He had penetrated his barrier, and it was clear that he had used the body to shield himself from the lightning attack that he had wrought. His sword was sheathed, however, but there was energy being charged in his hand. Ryobala. He fired the orange laser through Sasakai's shoulder, and didn't waste time in creating another one. While Sasakai was stuck in recoil from the injury, he used the opportunity to puncture Sasakai's body with no less than a dozen holes, each of them created from a flurry of Ryobala. Fucking stubborn, Naruto commented, as the twelve shots didn't fall. However, Sasakai was reaching his limit. He grit his teeth as blood fell from his mouth, and Naruto charged up one last Ryobala. The last thing he saw was a grinning Naruto, as the Eren car fired a thirteenth and fatal shot straight through the vice captain's heart. In Hueco Mundo. Silence. Ichigo was beginning to get uncomfortable. All of the people in front of him were clearly just staring out into space, their eyes glossy in disbelief. He could practically feel the despair that was washing off of them. Some of the Shinigami in the back were murmuring to themselves, clearly not aware of who this Naruto person was. But Ichigo was talking to people such as Namike's Minato, Uzumaki Kushina, Jiraiya, and the friends that Naruto had made when he was alive. And they knew exactly who Naruto was. I don't believe it. Jiraiya was the one to break the silence. And I know. Hinata managed to squeak out. Her pupilless eyes were beginning to water profusely. All of the anger had been sucked out of the main group of the Konoha Association, and it had been replaced with utter despair. Nowhere was this more apparent than on the faces of Minato and Kushina themselves. Kushina was shaking violently now, and she felt sick to her stomach. Her knees wobbled, and she almost fell to the ground, but Minato caught her and wrapped an arm around her shoulder, pulling her close. Regardless of what they were feeling now, this proved nothing. They needed more information, and perhaps Ichigo could answer more of their questions. And Naruto, you say? Minato began. He tried to keep his cool, but it clearly wasn't working at all. His voice made a noticeable crack as he spoke, and it was far raspier than normal. Did you have any more information about that? Or do you just know the name? Ichigo looked confused. Uh, all I know is what this girl said once she came out of the trapdoor, though it was tough to piece together. Apparently, this Naruto had put her and the rest of her village down there, and basically tortured them for over a century. If you want more information regarding Naruto, all I know is that he was apparently an Arankar, if what her ramblings were anything to go by. She also mentioned that Naruto himself also came from her village. You're from there. Do you know anything about him? It was Ichigo's turn to ask the questions. That only confirmed what they had been dreading, and each of the members of the association felt their hearts drop into their stomachs. It became clear to them that it was Uzumaki Naruto himself who had done such a horrible thing, but worst of all, Uzumaki Naruto was a hollow. Yeah, I know him. That was all Minato had to say on the subject. He was beginning to get dizzy, and he could still hear Ichigo's words ringing in his head. How? Shikamaru spoke up. Even he was shaken by the news. Naruto, the Naruto is a hollow? And he's the one who destroyed Kanoha? How is he a hollow? How did he not reach Soul Society? He should be right here, with all of us. But instead we lost him to the hollow, and this has happened. 
This, this is so fucked up. Jiraiya boisterously vocalized. That was truly what they were all thinking at the moment. What do we do, Minato? Tsunade asked. The leader of the Kanoha Association shook his head, pulling Kushina closer to him. It pains me to say this, but we're going to have to continue on and search for Naruto. No matter our feelings on the subject, he did a horrible thing to our village. He is Volpasi, and he is an enemy to Soul society. Hinata was openly crying now, and Naruto's other friends from life were staring at the floor, finding the ground particularly interesting as they didn't say anything. We will find Naruto, and we will confront him about this incident, Minato said. His voice wavered slightly, and a resonation flashed through the crowd as Minato turned back towards Ichigo. Ichigo-san, do you know where Naruto possibly is now? Minato asked. Ichigo rubbed his chin. We've been here ten years, so you can imagine that we've traveled through a great deal of Hueco Mundo. We've seen a few hollow kingdoms but we have heard his name being whispered in the darkest corners of hollow colonies. He's dreaded around here, clearly. But there is one thing that always pops up. He trailed off, building suspense within the minds of the Kanoha Association. To the east, that is what is always said with regards to him. To the east, to the east. Hollows more often than not travel to the east. If you want to find him, then you should travel east, and ask a true hollow for more information. The hollows around here know more about his legend than I do. I see. Thank you, Minato said somberly. He turned back to his sensei, his wife, and his son's former friends. All right, let's go. We don't have time to waste, he turned back to Ichigo. Would you like to go back with us? I'd imagine neither of you want to spend the rest of your lives in Hueco Mundo, Minato offered. Ichigo and Oriheim looked at each other and Minato offered a hand to Ichigo. Ichigo took it. Chapter 54 El Dios Vaij Even in the face of such danger, Yamamoto Genryu Saishigakuni remained a stern, steadfast spirit. He wasn't at his desk any longer, but was now standing directly on his balcony, overlooking the pure chaos ahead. He had not taken action. All he had done was give out orders to the captains of Soul Society. They would lead the divisions in a counterattack, but right now it didn't seem like it was working. He had already felt the riatsu of several of his captains disappear, and the Kanoha Association was not back yet. Yamamoto's mind turned. The departure of the Kanoha Association and the arrival of this hollow army seemed too grandiose to be coincidence. What were the odds that as soon as dozens of his best Shinigami go on leave, the largest four soul society has ever faced appears? Either those Shinigami from Kanoha had another agenda, which seemed highly unlikely, or this was all staged from the beginning by the Hollow Force, who handpicked the exact moment they were gone to strike. If the latter was true, then how were stupid beasts such as Hollow able to coordinate such a plan? Yamamoto knew how. It meant, someone in Soul Society was a traitor. His eyes were locked on a portion of Soul Society. A massive blue Ciro had just been fired from an avenue in Siriidei far away from his position. It was clearly much more powerful than a normal Ciro. Yamamoto banged his stick against the ground. This had gone on long enough. He needed to take action, for two particular reasons. One, to rid Soul Society of the Ryoka. And two, to scold his forces for daring to lose. He banged his staff against the ground again. What do you want? He could tell, of course he could tell. The Ryatsa near him was as bloodthirsty as could possibly be. Someone, most likely an errand car by the looks of things, had infiltrated his office. There was a crash, and a gust of wind. A limp body crashed into the railing directly next to Yamamoto, flopping to the ground in an unnatural position. Clearly a corpse. When Yamamoto took one look at the face of the corpse, he nearly snapped the wooden end of his staff clean in two. The neat silver hair and mustache, the pale eyes that looked even paler than normal now that they were glossed over. It was his vice-captain of a thousand years, Sasakai Chujuru. He didn't shout or curse. In fact, he didn't say anything. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see a figure standing casually near the door to his office. At that distance, it was clear who had thrown Sasakai's body. He turned around slowly 
taking in the appearance of the intruder. He was a short, blonde-haired Arankar, rather young-looking. If he were a denizen of his soul's society, he would appear as little more than a child. Yet Yamamoto knew better. Beneath that appearance was a true hollow, a beast that had spent dozens, if not hundreds of years devouring souls. He used his bankai, but it wasn't anything impressive, the loathsome Arankar commented. He stood in front of me without any fear, but when I told him I knew about his bankai he went nuts. And then, he gasped for breath. I killed him. The second no. The millisecond Narigo had said those things. Yamamoto's staff disintegrated into ash, the top half of his Shinigami robe burned away and he was left clutching a normal katana with a black hilt. Turn everything to ash, Ryujin Jaka. He wasted no time. Naruto was impressed. Flames consumed the entire balcony, and Naruto was already beginning to breathe slightly heavier due to the suffocating ryatsu that engulfed the surrounding atmosphere. Deep within his old, blackened heart, he felt the sort of primal, animalistic fear that emerges when staring down an apex predator. And it exhilarated him. Naruto focused his ryatsu, and released it all. Every single drop of ryatsu within his system was put into the spiritual pressure he made, to the point of him forcing it out. Wow, Naruto said in a rare moment of all. His full ryatsu was a powerful orange tornado that would choke the life out of anything it touched, a tempest that would bore through anything. And yet, even it was not comparable to the power of Yamamoto's Zanpakutu. Naruto smiled. The old man would be so fun to kill. In the back of his mind, he could feel all the Ryatsu around Siriidei, all the members of his Arankar army, and all the Shinigami. The battle had almost ceased, and he knew the reason why. They could feel, no, they knew down to their very souls what was going on. They could see the inferno and tornado rise high above the first division's battle, and it struck fear into all of their hearts. Naruto knew it, and so he struck. Out of all the Espada that were fighting in Suriidei, Grimjaw was the one who was making the most out of the experience. While most of the Espada preferred to at least be subtle in the ways they killed, Grimjaw hopped from roof to roof, gutting Shinigami and generally causing havoc and destruction. It was safe to say that he was drawing the most attention. Yet, he hadn't met anyone who was even able to slow him down in the slightest. He even forgot what he was supposed to be doing. Grimjow sama Grimjow halted in his tracks, a look of abject irritation coming onto his face. The rest of the espada had already sent their fraction off. As for him, he didn't have fraction anymore, yet this errand car was content on following him around. He had already told him to get lost. What? He turned around as the young-looking Arankar following him caught up, breathing heavily as fatigue overtook him. His brown hair was flattened by the headband-like mask on the top of his head. W wait for me, Grimjow sama Grimjow growled. Look, kid. I'm not your commanding espada, so I don't get why you've been following me around all this time. But this is an invasion of soul society. You can't just follow me all day and do nothing here. Go off on your own and kill some Shinigami. If you don't, there's going to be hell to pay once this is over. The young Arankar looked like Grim Jiao had just kicked his puppy. What's your name anyway, kid? Keikino Amaru, the Arankar breathed out. Stupid name, kid. That's the kind of name a Shinigami would have. But Grim Jiao stopped himself when he felt the rising of a certain spiritual pressure. It felt familiar, like the kind he had fought before. He flashed away, not so gently grabbing Kanoamaru and shoving him out of the way as a column of ice appeared directly where the two of them had been standing, freezing the tiles on the street and the surrounding buildings. Grimjaw appeared on a roof a safe distance from the ice, dropping Kanoamaru to the ground with a heavy thud. The other Arankar scrambled to the edge of the roof, his eyes quivering as he saw the damage the ice caused. What was that? I've seen that before. Grimjow growled. Ice, and a lot of it. Judging by the captain-level Ryatsu he was feeling, and the fact that he had fought an ice-wielding captain before made it pretty obvious who he was dealing with here. He closed his eyes, feeling more Ryatsu's signatures enter within the range of his pesquisa. They were all small fry, 
so they were probably just a platoon that was meant to accompany their captain in neutralizing the Erenkar threat. Grimjow growled, and fired a zero point blank towards where he sensed the Ryatsu. It was at this point that Grimjow knew that the average Shinigami was incredibly, unfathomably weak. The fact that his haphazard, Eren Siro obliterated four Shinigami like that was proof of it. I mean, he didn't even look as he fired that thing, and it still killed a handful of them. Wow, Grimjow sama That was incredible! Kanoa Maru exclaimed. Grimjow grunted. That kid was still here, and he was still being as useless as ever. If you're going to stand there and be impressed. Grimjow began dangerously. Then why don't you get out there and fight? He finished in a near roar to Kanoamaru. Kanoamaru flinched at the tone from his superior, and a beat of sweat rolled down his temple. Why, yes, sir. Grimjow surveyed the scene in front of him. Leave that white haired kid to me. You can handle him. But make sure to clean up the rest of the trash while I'm busy with him. Grimjow ordered, to which Kanoamaru saluted. With his subordinate in order, he turned to address the leader of the pack of Shinigami. The white-haired kid had changed a little bit over the past decade or so, but was still recognizable even to him. The only key differences were that he looked a little older since then, maybe a year or two. What Grimjow was concerned about was how his strength had changed. If he was still the same, well, Grimjow would just walk all over him. You. I remember you. You're the stupid kid who somehow made it to captain rank. I fought you around a decade ago. Guess you're still alive and kickin'. What was your name again? Uh. Grimjow snapped his fingers along to his speech, trying to remember. The captain glared at him. It's the 10th Division Captain, Hitsugaya Tushiru, he said annoyed. And I remember you as well. Grimjow Jigerjax, you were one of the premier Erenkar in Aizen Sasug's army, but you and the rest of the Erenkar disappeared a decade ago. I never thought you would appear now of all times. Well, what can I say? My boss likes to be thorough. Aizen is dead. We have confirmed it. This boss of yours is not Aizen. I know. Hitsugaya replied. Yeah, but it's not any of your business who the boss is, though. No way we'd follow some punk-ass Shinigami longer that we'd have to. That's why Aizen is dead. Hitsugaya continued to glare. But that's not important right now. What is important right now is this. Grimjow trailed off, before he pointed an accusatory finger at Hitsugaya. You better give me a good fight here, none of that bullshit from last time. So you better have gotten way stronger since then, or else I'm gonna mop the floor with ya. He felt the cold chill of Hitsugaya's Ryatsu. It was definitely heavier than it was last time, and it carried an air of much more experience and maturity that came along with age. By all means, Grimjow should have been intimidated, but he wasn't. Instead, he smiled a wide grin, characteristic of a battle seeker like him. Impressive, kid. This Ryatsu is way better than last time. It looks like we'll be able to have a much better fight. Still, there's no fucking way you're any match for me. Hitsugaya Taishu. One of Hitsugaya's subordinates called out, as Grimjow released his own Ryatsu. H. Hitsugaya narrowed his eyes a little, but otherwise showed no indication that he was intimidated. Fall back. You'll only get in my way. This is clearly one of the lead Aaron cars and an ex-Espada, and something only a captain can handle. You are all to split into two groups, and lend support wherever necessary while neutralizing the Aaron car threat, he ordered to his soldiers. Grimjow had his own set of orders, however. Kid! Don't let any of those weak fuckers leave. Slaughter them all! He barked to Kanoamaru. You got it, Grimjow sama Kanoamaru said cheerfully, as if he wasn't about to slaughter a bunch of Shinigami. His index finger flew to his waist, wrapping under a loop that formed as the hilt and guard of his Zanpakutu. He hoisted it out with one finger, holding its point down. Shriek, chimpanz! The Shinigami cringed as Kanoamaru's Ryatsu spiked. In a whirl of green Ryatsu that almost looked like a torrent of leaves, his appearance changed. His body shifted and became beefy and ripped, while bony material appeared on his head, giving off the appearance of a war helmet. His teeth lengthened into brutal-looking fangs, while the same material covered his chest and shoulders. 
a long brown tail sprouted from his backside, whipping around in the wind. And finally, his posture hunched over as he began to knuckle walk, growling ever so slightly. The Shinigami seemed to be at a complete loss as to what to do, until Konoamaru gave off an ear splitting shriek and began pounding his chest with his enormous fists. Grimjow actually looked slightly impressed. Well, I've got a hand to you, kid. You've at least got the fear part of being an Erencar down. Meanwhile, it looked like Hitsugai just realized that he was about to lose dozens of his own men. Stand your ground. Do not let that Erencar intimidate you. Too late. With a fierce roar, Kanoamaru moved at a speed that a big body like his shouldn't be allowed to move out. He broke right into the middle of the line of Shinigami, just as they had pulled their swords from their sheaths. Kanoamaru's sword release seemed to be all about brute strength, and he showed it when he shot forth with a lightning-fast punch towards the nearest Shinigami. The enormous fist impacted the woman's head, which flew clean off her shoulders and rocketed thirty feet in the opposite direction. The other Shinigami gaped in alarm at his sheer power, and they fearfully backed up. Hey, you guys, Hitsuge started, but he sensed movement from Grimjow, and brought his blade up to block it. I shot out from the contact between two swords, but Grimjow was undeterred. You don't have time to worry about your lackey's kid. Just focus on me, or your reflexes will slow down, and you'll get yourself killed. Grimjow lectured. The two combatants backed up, and Grimjow tossed his Zanpaku to back and forth between each hand. He rushed at Hitsugaya recklessly, sword extended. Hayo Rinmaru! Hitsugaya called out, summoning his already activated Shurikai. The dragon of ice wiggled its way onto the battlefield, opening its mouth and roaring. Grimjow didn't pay it any mind. The ice dragon collided with the Erenkar, bathing him in the frigid substance. Despite that, it only froze him solid for a couple of seconds, and by that time he had already broken free and was rushing at Hitsugaya once again. What is this? Do you honestly think you can even slow me down with just your Shurikai? Stop being such a bitch and use your Bankai already. Grimjow shouted, smashing his blade recklessly down on Hitsugaya, with no regard for defense. Physically, Grimjow was far stronger than the young Hitsugaya and the captain could tell that Grimjow could almost snap his blade clean in half with the amount of force he was providing, and the little amount of resistance that he himself was giving. He heard more cries of agony from beside him, but he couldn't even think of faltering and glancing over his shoulder with the type of pressure he was under. Just so you know, I happen to have regained my status as an espada. Septima espada, Grimjow Jigerjax. I'm way different from last time, when I had just one arm and couldn't even release my Zanpaku to. Grimjow cried. Release. Hitsugaya called out, not readily equipped to want to deal with an Espada's sword release at the moment. Grimjow held out his Zanpaku to, scraping his fingernails against the edge of the blade. Hitsugaya was prepared to stop the ritual by any means necessary. I won't let you! Hitsugaya shouted. Bankai! Dagirin Hyorinmaru! Ice materialized on Hitsugaya in the form of wings and talons, making him the visage of a miniature-looking dragon. The air around them chilled, and Grimjow almost felt his skin freeze upon contact from the heavy Riatsu. Just kidding! Grimjow guffawed, stopping his pre packet to release ritual as Hitsugaya flapped his icy wings and soared towards the Erenkar. He sidestepped the thrust from Hitsugaya, as Ice crashed forward towards where Hitsugaya stabbed. He held his sword with two hands, going in with his own thrust as he attempted to chip away at Hitsugaya's wing. The ice folded over itself, and Grimjow's Zanpakutu only made a slight dent in the ice. Hitsugaya tried to sweep right through him with his sword, but Grimjow was faster. He used Sonido to get away from the swipe, but Hitsugaya was hot on his tail with Shunpa. The two engaged in a fast-paced sword battle in midair, both of them taking quick and agile jabs at each other. But as the fight went on, it became apparent to Grimjow that he wasn't able to keep up with Hitsugaya like this. Whoa! Grimjow cried out, as Hitsugaya swung his tail like a pike. Grimjow knew already that this ice was strong enough to freeze him solid, unlike the ice that he was using with his Shurikai. Hitsugaya swung his tail once again, and Grimjow backflipped over the captain, coming down to kneel upon the tiled ground. There were a few beads of sweat rolling down his face. 
the Septima whistled. Those wings of yours are bigger than last time, and those ice flowers are gone too. I suppose you've worked on your fighting abilities. That timer for you Bankai doesn't exist anymore, meaning you can keep that Bankai out without a time limit. Hitsugaya floated onto the ground, a stoic look on his face. At that same moment, three Shinigami came flying over, almost bowling over the young-looking captain as they sailed between the two combatants. Their bodies were bruised and bloodied. Hitsugaya gasped. What is going on here? Don't tell me you guys are having that much trouble with one errand car. He cried out. The three Shinigami couldn't answer for two reasons. One, they were gurgling up too much blood to be understandable. And two, there was currently a large shadow underneath them, rapidly getting bigger. The Shinigami screamed as a big monkey errand car fell on top of them, crushing them into paste and making a giant crater in the ground. Kanoamaru shrieked and beat his chest, motivated over his victory. Impressive kid! You're not as big of a bitch as I thought, said Grimjow to Kanoamaru. Hitsugaya wasn't impressed, however, but it was in that where Grimjow saw the biggest opening. You don't have time to focus on him, Grimjow said, crashing his blade down on Hitsugaya's shoulder and chipping off a big portion of the ice. Hitsugaya had been trying to take out Kanoamaru in the meantime before he could do any more damage, but clearly Grimjow wasn't about to let that happen. You shouldn't pick on the small fry. They don't really like that much. Hey kid, let him have it. He shouted at Kanoamaru. Kanoamaru noticed that the captain was locked in combat with Grimjow and currently occupied, so he took advantage of the situation. Like always, he used his physical power to try to flatten Hitsugaya. However, the young captain outstretched a wing that managed to hold up against Kanoamaru's strength, while simultaneously parrying both Kanoamaru and Grimjow. Grimjow managed to avoid the strike, but Kanoamaru wasn't so lucky. Hitsugaya's bank I caught his left side, freezing his ribs and rendering him immobile. Grimjow grit his teeth angrily, but otherwise didn't say anything. He realized that Kanoamaru was near useless now though, so he wouldn't bother trying to get him in on the fight. At that moment, something happened which made Grimjow realize that he needed to stop messing around. All of a sudden, it felt much harder to breathe. His lungs burned, like he had inhaled hot ash. That wasn't what was concerning him, though. It was what happened just a second after that. A familiar crushing reaction that could be felt within the very atmosphere itself arose. It was like a tempest, and it was suffocating. And it was clashing with the heat fighting it. With both of them together, it was almost maddening, even to an espada like him. He could even see it from his vantage point. How couldn't he? Everyone could see it. The scorching hellfire and the whirling tornado that rose high above Soul Society in the First Division's barracks. It was awe-inspiring, but it also was sending a message. Naruto was starting. He winced and grinned, looking over at Hitsugaya. He could tell that the captain was barely capable of keeping his bankai active within the current heat, but it wasn't the heat he wasn't concerned about. It was the strong, foreign Ryatsu. What is this? One of these is without a doubt, Yamamoto Satechi's Ryatsu, but this other one. I don't know, he muttered to himself. Grimjow raised his sword. Sorry, kid. The fact that we're feeling this means that my boss has started fighting with your boss. He's done fucking around, so we're gonna have to speed this up, okay? He trailed off. Right now, all I need is your key. Back in Hueco Mundo, Ichigo had joined up with the Kanoha Association, and they had been traveling east for quite some time now. That's what Ichigo had said to do anyway. There was a glum atmosphere that pervaded throughout the group, particularly in the upper echelons of the association. The truth about Naruto still stung with all of them, and Ichigo didn't want to intrude. As they continued to move east, the party sans Ichigo and Oriheim were surprised to see the sandy deserts of Hueco Mundo turn into grassy fields. The night sky still hung perpetually overhead, but this place actually looked remarkably like the human world or Rukangai. Ichigo kept stealing glances at Minato every once in a while. He hadn't said a word since they had left the palace. Few people have, but there was something about Minato that seemed far more contemplative. He's my son, you know, Minato said finally, after he noticed for the third time that Ichigo was staring at him. 
Ichigo felt like a rock had just dropped into his stomach. Why your son? Who is? He asked, but he already knew the answer. Minato smiled at him like nothing was wrong, but Ichigo could tell immediately that everything was wrong. Naruto is, he croaked. Ichigo swallowed. That hollow? The person you've been searching for all this time, and the one you just found out did all those things? Minato nodded. I am so sorry. I had no idea. Don't apologize. In hindsight, we should have figured it out years ago. Why? Why did we not find him, when we had all the tools of soul society at our disposal? Why did we not find him after decades and decades of searching? Minato barked out a humorless laugh. Now it all makes sense, he finished. Minato-san. Let's just keep moving, he said, changing the subject. We need to move east quickly, and find him. He is our responsibility, and we will personally put a stop to his madness. It W wasn't supposed to be like this. He heard Kushina pipe up from behind in the crowd a little. A realization dawned on Ichigo. She was Minato's wife, and had been for as long as he knew, so that meant that she must have been Naruto's mother. It's not just that. We all knew him too. Ichigo turned around, to see Inazuka Kiba walking glumly alongside his group of friends. The normally spirited Shinigami was looking as glum as everyone else. Me, Hanada, Shikamaru, Ino, Niji. We all knew him when we were alive. We were friends. Some of us grew up together at the Ninja Academy when we were just kids. He loved Konoha. The idea that Naruto would become a hollow and eventually destroy the village he once loved is hard to stomach. Kiba, don't talk about him right now, Niji said sternly. Kiba read the situation. Hinata was sniffling and the overall atmosphere of the group became even worse. Fortunately, something came along to distract the group for a while. A small gopher-like hollow emerged from the ground, looked around before spotting the Shinigami, yelped in alarm, and attempted to burrow back underground. Minato turned to Jiraiya, who nodded to his student. Quick as a flash, he snatched up the gopher hollow from the ground, holding it aloft as it squirmed. Its little strength was useless though, and it hung limply in Jiraiya's arm, awaiting its fate. Hold it right there. The gopher hollow turned around cautiously, to see Jiraiya leering at him in a comical, exaggerated angry face. The gopher hollow gaped underneath its mask. I'd like to ask you a few questions if you don't mind. H.M. Like I got anything to say to a bunch of bitch-ass Shinigami. Go screw yourself. The loud-mouthed gopher exclaimed suddenly overcome by a dose of bravery. Jiraiya grinned evilly, before bringing down his knuckles on the poor hollow's head. He niggied him roughly for a moment or two, the gopher hollow giving horrible shrieks and cries before it finally gave in. All right. All right. What do you want from me? The gopher whined, rubbing its mask for a couple seconds. At that point, Jiraiya turned all serious. We're looking for a hollow by the name of Vulpus Sea. In these parts, you'd probably recognize him by the name Naruto. Do you know anything about him? Jiraiya asked. The gopher's masked face took on an expression of absolute terror, much more than Jiraiya was capable of doing with a simple nugi. The main members of the Kanoha Association huddled around him. And Naruto? The gopher hollow squeaked. Looks like we've got a keeper. Jiraiya sighed, allowing the little hollow to continue. Why, yeah. I know him all right. Hard not to around these parts, with the things he's accomplished. And I know I'm not supposed to be helping Shinigami and whatnot, but as far as I'm concerned, there's no enemies when it comes to deal with that creature. Just stay away from him. F for your own sakes. That was not the answer that anyone in the Kanoha Association had been expecting. What we do with ourselves is none of your business, Hollow. Just tell me, where can we find him? Jiraiya asked coldly. The gopher hollow's eyes became glossy and apathetic. If you insist, I'll tell you where to find him. Continue heading east until about forty miles from the ocean. You should come across a great canyon, larger than anything you would see in Soul Society. That is Naruto's encampment. He should be there. Ocean? Jiraiya inquired. Since when was there an ocean with Waco Mundo? 
Nevertheless, as they traveled farther into it, it was apparent that there were plants there, but they would save the inquiries over the landscape of Hueco Mundo later. For now, they needed to move. Jiraiya threw away the gopher hollow none too gently, and it landed dazed in the dirt as the company moved on. They passed through fields of tall grass and light forests, and it was Minato who saw the large, scraping canyon that stretched across the landscape like a landmark. There it is, Minato said, with an air of finality. We're here, Kushina added. And somewhere down there, we'll find Naruto, she finished, tears welling into her eyes. Minato nodded at his wife. Let's put an end to this. Wait, Kushina. Everyone, look over there, Minato said, as his eyes were drawn to what sat on the right edge of the canyon. The Kanoha Association swiveled their heads over to the right, perplexed at what they were seeing. It's sort of like like a village, maybe? No, that wasn't right. The correct word for it would probably be outpost, but nonetheless it was still more advanced than anything they had seen in Hueco Mundo, save Las Noches, of course. A village? Hinata echoed. There were a few dozen tents set up along the outpost, as well as a massive long hall in the center. She did notice a few hollow moving around the outpost, and they weren't normal hollows either. They were mostly ajuchas. Ajuchas, and a lot of them, remarked Jiraiya. Maybe we should check out that outpost first? That sounds like a sound plan. But I will go alone on this one. We need information, and I think it's about time to employ some of my old ninja skills. The rest of you bunker down here and wait for me to return, he said to his friends. They would be sure to relay that information to the rest of the group. With the Kanoha Association hunkered down, Minato crept closer to the village. When he was a good enough distance to actually comprehend what was going on, he realized that this group was up to something. What are they up to? He snuck up into the village when there were no hollows in the immediate vicinity sliding his back against the long hall behind a few barrels that concealed him. He peered inside the window. There were a few regular hollows sitting at the big table talking to A. Vast O Lord. Disregarding the extremely high-level hollow, this should hold some information. The invasion. Minato heard one of the hollows say, as a little snippet of the conversation going on in there. Invasion? The second wave of attack is to begin shortly. We have to be prepared. Once Suryagi has been cleaned up by the Espada, we will be brought into to the main event and the battle with the Royal Guard. Minato's eyes widened. Second wave? Invasion? Suryagi? Did this mean that Soul Society was under attack right now while the Kanoha Association twiddled their thumbs in Hueco Mundo? There was no way this was a coincidence. Suryagi was rarely ever invaded, let alone by an attack force of hollows. How would occur at the same exact time that the Kanoha Association was in Hueco Mundo, and the two forces would miss each other? Someone had set them up. I need to let the others know about this immediately. He whispered to himself. Hey, why don't you stop sneaking around and come inside? We don't bite much. Minato's breath hitched in his throat at the voice that came from right beside him. He hadn't even sensed any Ryatsu spike but how could he have been snuck up on so easily? He tilted his head over to the side. It was the hollow from inside. The vast o lord that was apparently getting briefed. As quietly as he could, he rose to his feet, gripping his zampakutu as he glared at the vast o lord. It didn't even flinch, and just remained there with a bored expression on its mask. Who are you? What was that conversation about? He demanded. The hollow which was a gray humanoid with six spikes encircling his shoulders, spoke. My name is Valakav. I suppose you can call me the reserve general in the Erenkar army. I'm in charge of holding down the home front while the Espada are away. And you should not be here. That doesn't answer my question with regards to that conversation. What are you planning? Minato demanded yet again. He was shouting now, and a multitude of Hollow and Erenkar were crowding around the two of them hissing at the Shinigami menacingly. Valakav simply waved an arm, and they all backed off and fell silent. The old Vasto lord regarded him with a strange look, but there was no hostility behind that gaze. Unfortunately, at this point there is nothing we can do. I know who you are, 
and I know that you are vital to this operation. Naruto wants you alive after all. Minato perked up at this. Naruto? I knew it. He is here. Where is he? Minato shouted. Valakav sighed. You don't get it, do you? He said lightly. Your son's a monster, Namike's Minato. There's no getting around that, and right now he's currently making a crater the size of Iceland out of the Syriidae. And here you are wandering around the Hueco Mundo like a chicken with its head cut off. This wasn't supposed to happen, and now I'm going to have to find a way to fix it, he paused. I told you that you were vital to this operation. Naruto wants you alive, which means that no one here can kill you. And that's why I'm telling you all to his information. Without it, you'd still be lurking around Hueco Mundo in the dark while the operation continues without you. You need to go back to Suriidei. Minato obviously didn't take this news very well. He's what? I'll make it a little simpler right now. Your son is the Primera Espada, and the leader of the most powerful fighting force that exists within Hueco Mundo. Right now, he is leading an attack on your soul society, and by all intents and purposes, he should have succeeded by now. And one more thing, he trailed off. He despises you. Naruto banged his Zanpakutu against Yamamoto's flame-wreathed one with all the force he could muster, his Ryatsu oozing out of his pores at full velocity. And yet, he was still almost incinerated instantly. Yamamoto's Shirkai was one of the most powerful things he had ever faced, and it had been a long time before something had exhilarated him this much. He cackled as a blast of flame pushed him back, searing his flesh. He emerged from the flames with nothing more than a few light burn marks but it was more than anyone had managed to do in years. Amazing! I've never felt anything like this before, not even when I was fighting Aizen. Naruto shrieked. The old Shinigami simply kept his stony gaze on Naruto, never saying a word. Swordsmanship alone will clearly not cut it on a Zanpakutu as strong as yours. I suppose it's time to kick it up a notch, he guffawed, grinning excitedly as his eyes flashed with madness. He held his Zanpaka to a loft with his left hand, while he placed his right hand on the face of the blade. Yamamoto watched him stoically, as Naruto began to charge up an orange siro in his right hand. However, this siro was slightly different. As soon as it formed in Naruto's hand, it seemed to take on a liquid-like shape, and to top it all off, it looked like it was being absorbed into Naruto's Zanpaka to. Siro Corazon, he shouted as his sword began to glow the same orange as one of his ciros. He swung it, and a wave of orange energy was released from the blade in a trail. Wherever it cut, it created ciros. My second of three unique ciros. And that's not all. Naruto tossed the ciro-charged sword to his right hand, and stuck his left hand out. It glowed with orange riatsu, but he wasn't forming a ciro. He was manipulating Yamamoto's riatsu. Extinter. He pulled his hand, and the flames wreathing Yamamoto moved to create a large opening in the circle of fire. Naruto took the chance. Still controlling the Ryatsu to a limited extent, he leaped through the opening and into the blaze, his Zanpakutu at the ready. Choke! He slammed his Zanpakutu down on Yamamoto, a wave of orange siro emerging from where the blade swung. Yamamoto brought his own fire up to shield himself against the siro but he was forced to skid back to avoid the physical aspect of the blade. The errant car was using a double-layered attack, but it was one that Yamamoto could handle. What was really grinding on Yamamoto's mind was the errant car's ability to seize a limited amount of control from his flames. Your flames are strong and laden with Ryatsu. I can't manipulate them fully, but I have plenty of other tricks up my sleeve. Naruto shouted. He was still manipulating Yamamoto's Ryatsu. The old captain had still not said anything. He poured his riatsu into a finger. Ryobala. The beam of light traveled straight through the flames, but it was meant as little more than a distraction. Yamamoto didn't flinch even as Naruto appeared in his blind spot, the flames parting to let him through via his powers. It was obvious what his intention was. The old Shinigami shunpoed away from the strike from Naruto sprouting a geyser of fire where he anticipated Naruto would be one second later. Naruto yelped as he flashed out of the way from the pillar of great fire, charging up a new technique. 
He didn't get the chance, though, as four more pillars sprung up around me, limiting his movements lest he accidentally spring another one. He managed to slice through one using his high riatsu and riatsu manipulation abilities, but more continued to spring up. Right now, he knew that fighting Yamamoto would be difficult. At this point, he didn't know who would win even if the both of them would all out from the start. Fortunately, all Naruto had to do was stall him. And what better way to do that than with a little taunting? Bala del Artista His final form of Bala did not charge up any energy in his hands. Rather, seven blips of orange light appeared in the middle of the air, before stretching down towards the ground like spears. Altogether, they formed a cage. What do you think? Looks familiar, don't it? He taunted. Naruto was manipulating his ballast to make them look like a replica of Sasakai's Bankai, and when that happened, something within Yamamoto snapped. Such disrespect. It must be mortifying for you. Sasakai. To see your beloved and prized Bankai be used as an imitation by a lowly Arankar. I feel like I should apologize to you for allowing this to happen. Yamamoto finally spoke. Naruto grinned over at him, satisfied over finally provoking a response out of the old captain, even if it wasn't exactly directed at him. Yamamoto's face was even stonier though. Naruto didn't know what he was up to until... Bankai, he said stoically, and the assortment of flames disappeared immediately. Eh? The life had been completely sucked out of the atmosphere. And Yukitake and Kiraka both knew it. Do you believe this, Kiraka? Yukitake asked, from his perch above. He was currently locked in sword combat with Stark, who finally seemed to realize that he needed to fight. Yukitake almost seemed to forget about Stark for a moment. You can feel that, right? This sense of dryness, the temperature has risen. Yukitake commented. Down below, Kiraka's sure guy was not having much luck with Haribel, who still hadn't released. Of course I can feel it, he said, no smile on his face. It's unbelievable. Genryusai Sensei's Bankai. I expected him to take to the front line, but I never expected him to use his Bankai right now. Yukitake commented. Don't be surprised. We have yet to make any ground against these two Espadas, and they are not even the top ranked within their group. It's not out of the realm of possibility that they have a true monster at the top. Is that right? Kiraka smiled lightly as he addressed Haribel. I have nothing to say to that. Yeah, I figured. But if Yamaji is using his Bankai, it means we can't afford to stand here and take our time with our battles. I'm sorry, but we will have to defeat you immediately. Kiraka said casually. That won't be necessary, a new voice commanded. The two older captains turned around at the source of the new voice, as a new Arankar appeared in the middle of the 8th Division Square. Okuyora. Haribel muttered. If you're here, you have not taken any action throughout the invasion. What have you been doing all this time? Yes. I have been going around the Soul Society secretly during the chaos, fulfilling the mission that we were given. I came to inform the two of you that the preparations are nearly complete. I have collected eleven of the thirteen master keys while the captains have been busy. Naruto has additionally gained the final two, meaning that we have now acquired the full thirteen. We are ready to begin phase two of the operation. But as you may have guessed, he paused for a moment, feeling the hot air on his skin. Naruto has taken action. There is one last obstacle to take care of before we proceed. In addition, Sail and Barrigan have been lost but we need all the remaining espada to rendezvous where Naruto is right now. Finish up your fights quickly. Stark's expression changed before he sighed. We can do that. Wait. The thirteen keys. Your army has been collecting them the whole time. How did you figure out the secret to those keys? Yukitake shouted at Okuyora. Okuyora glared slightly up at him. That is not for you to know. And this phase too. It can't be anything good if you're collecting those keys. But what I don't understand is what you're doing to get to that point. Kiraka said, joining the conversation. Alquiora narrowed his eyes at him, but otherwise remained expressionless. It's simple. It means that Yamamoto Genryosai is about to die. 